All right, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, get started and do my official welcome to you guys to um, our boot camp for two weeks. And for the next few hours, we're going to be uh, spending some time that's not on a technical level. Um, during my um, during my interesting fun fact, um, I used to share this one fun fact, and now I just share it at the beginning of this because it is something I'm really proud of. This has been a very interesting year for me. I've had a lot of lot of different things. In fact, when I think about 2019, I'm like, wow, a lot has happened. But, but when I started off the year, um, this was me. This was back in March um, when I was in Sydney. I mentioned that I was in Sydney. So uh, this was me for several years. If you watch some of my old videos, I missed me today. So had a, which I uh, think is 88 kilo, kilos for those of you that are kilo people. So I've had a, had a significant change in my health, although I was always healthy, but um, so that's been one of my changes. Another uh, really fortunate change, uh, in addition to my move, I told you guys about my move. Now, the good thing is, uh, one thing you'll notice is I did not, and shame on you for bringing those treats, <laughs> shame on you, <laughs> because you'll, you'll notice I'm very diligent about about my diet, I actually don't eat until four o'clock. I'm I'm on one of the fasting diets. I do the, the intermittent fasting, so I don't eat until four o'clock. You'll notice, um, including these nasty treats that I saw you bring in. Um, but uh, moving to a place like Southern California actually really helps keep keep your mind on the diet and the fitness because you're outside a lot more and on the beach. I'm really close to the beach, it's really cool. I really enjoy that. Another really uh, nice thing about this last year, and it's actually been the last couple of years, is I've had, uh, in my work, I've had a lot of opportunities to do some uh, international travel for our distributor uh, audience. A couple of you I, I heard mention, uh, mentioned you were with distributors, and I'm curious if, if you've even had an opportunity to uh, work with any of our distributor trainers. So we have partner training, which is very similar to the training you guys are going to be going through. Um, I create partner materials. And what we, what we have is we have a program where our distributors around the world, they go out and they teach our partners. Instead of you guys spending your time trying to teach all the partners, we have our distributors teaching them. And so we have a train the trainer program that our distributors go through, those that have been approved to become trainers for us. And I have had the really fortunate opportunity to go around to all these amazing cities around the world and do these train the trainers. At the beginning of the train the trainer, we actually go through exactly what you guys are going to be going through in the next several hours, presentation skills. Uh, one of my favorite stops in January was in China. Um, I went to well, Shanghai, but, uh, but the actual training was in Beijing, and I got to experience and walk on the Great Wall of China, which was an amazing experience for me. But one of the things that really stood out to me during this trip, uh, when I do presentation skills, I also did it uh, in June in Tokyo as well. And I'm always thinking to myself, well, different cultures are going to handle this very differently. In, in how they interact with their audience and how they take some of these techniques that I'm going to be sharing with you today. And one of the things we're going to be talking about today is how you open your presentation. Now, there was a gentleman in my class in Beijing. The way that he opened his presentation is something that I will still, it's been almost a year, and I still remember this like it was yesterday. And I want to tell you about how he opened his presentation they uh, do something slightly different. They don't pick any topic. They actually uh, are going to teach portions of the slides that they will be teaching on. So this was a section of LT and fundamental slides. That's all I'm going to tell you. He was opening his presentation on one of the LT and fundamentals topics. I want to tell you how he opened it. And I'm going to curious if any of you can figure out exactly what topic he was talking about. You start off by talking about way, way back in ancient Chinese, China times, Chinese times, um, some, I don't remember the name, some you know, ancient ruler who had a large collection of wives. Now, of course, he said this you know, ruler could not satisfy all of these wives. So 
what he did is he had a selection process for the wives that he found the most appealing, and those were the wives he spent his time with. All the other wives were sort of you know, categorized in ways that uh, were on standby. But now if one of his most appealing wives was unable to, this is his opening, <laughs> was unable to satisfy him, maybe a couple of them, all of a sudden he didn't have enough wives to satisfy him. So he'd go to his next group of wives that were on the next level of his high uh, enjoyment list, and they would become part of his new list of wives that would satisfy him until these wives were once again feeling better. Does anybody know what topic he was teaching on? Um, auto scale? No. <laughs> Ratio based uh, load balancing? Or, uh, Sounds like that. Priority based? Priority. Say it again? Priority, priority based? What is priority what? Priority? Priority what? Load balancing? Priority group? Priority group what? Priority group what? Come on guys, L Team Fundamentals. Priority group activation. Thank you. Activation. You guys should all, if you don't know priority group activation, go back and do your L Team Fundamentals. It's a very important L Team Fundamentals topic. Um, when he was doing this, I was like, I was, my, I, I was like, wow. Now, could he do that in a real presentation? I am not sure. But it's one of the most dramatically interesting openings I've ever seen one of my students ever use. Very creative, very, you know, very, got the entire audience's attention. And it came from somebody in Beijing, in China. And I would not have expected that. And that changed my thought that in certain parts of the country, I'm sorry, in certain parts of the world, people wouldn't do that kind of thing. He even did it better. And what's important, the reason I tell you this story is because a year later, I still remember that so distinctly. It's in my memory. I will never forget that particular presenter. And that's what's so important about what we're going to be covering, is you want to be remembered in the same way as a presenter. You want people to remember you that way. It makes you a lot more entertaining. Before we actually dive into what we're going to be covering, I'm going to show you a short video. And then when the video is done, I'm going to ask you a question about it, okay? My laptop is dead. It's frozen. I have no idea what happened to my laptop. God. Here. You can have my credit card. Why don't you take my ID? Better yet, here's my health card. And Julie, I'm going to give you $100. So, you know, I've just lost my laptop. I don't know what happened to it. And I've just lost a lot of my incredibly confidential, valuable information. Um, I want to explain within a couple of minutes the difference between what we call network attacks and application attacks. Um, there are two things we do here, and they're, usually it's very confusing for people, especially people at F5, to kind of explain the difference between the two. Um, there are hackers out there all over the world. And the different kinds of hackers, they target different kinds of systems. When things like my laptop or servers get taken offline, quite often that's a network attack where the hacker is truly just focused on taking that resource down so that the next day on the Today Show they can see that, oh look, I was successful. I got this attack, uh, I got this server down, this whole company's out of business for an hour. That means a lot to the hacker. But that's really all that's in it for them. Then we have more of an application-based hacker. Application hackers, they know how to get information into an application so that they can extract information, such as my credit card details, my banking information, my personal information, and even my money. 
And those kind of hackers, they're in it for the money. They're in it for the financial reward. Um, and us as consumers, we have a couple things. We're going to lose devices or we're going to lose money. They're both really important. And here at F5, we cover both of them. Um, I'm going to explain real quickly, and then later on today, I'll give you more details, the difference between network attack protection and application attack protection. I'm going to do with this envelope. So this envelope was sent to the White House. So at the White House, they obviously have a mail room. And in the mail room, they're going to do a lot of things by examining this package. They're going to make sure that it's addressed properly, that this is the correct address. Everything about the address is proper. They'll probably look at the return address, uh, the, the delivery, where it came from, make some determinations about that. Maybe it came from Syria. They might even look at just the, pack the package itself, you know? The stamp is correct. Everything about the package looks good. It looks good. So are they going to go and hand that package over to President Obama? Mm -hmm. The package looks fine. Mm -hmm. Why not? There could be danger inside. There could be danger inside the packet. Mm -hmm. So maybe somebody else has to actually open the package and make sure that there's something. <gasps> oh, no. <laughs> there's some powder in there. So when it comes to application versus network attacks, network attacks are protected by examining the package itself, making sure that it's addressed properly and so forth. Application attack protection actually looks at the content of the package thoroughly to make sure that nothing inside of there is going to be damaging to the recipient. And so that's sort of a summary of, sorry, <laughs> all over myself. And so later today, we'll talk a little bit more specifics about how they're done here at F5. Thank you. Okay, so here's um, the question I want to ask you now that you've seen that amazing video. Um, <laughs> imagine it's later today or tomorrow. Try to imagine that. If I were to ask you uh, to name one thing, just any one thing that you remember about that video, that you think you would remember, what is just one aspect of that presentation, of that video, that you think you would remember tomorrow, or at the end of this week, or at the end of next week. And I'm going to come around the room and I'm just going to see what answers you have. One aspect of that that you think you would remember. Uh, application mistakes. The which? Like, you know, yeah. the difference between the application, like the web uh, application attack and the network Okay. Uh, Using the envelope. Okay. Yeah. So the use of the envelope. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, same thing. The, the prop was clever. So the prop. Yes. The prop. Yeah, the prop. I like that word. John. Uh, the powder spilling out of the envelope. Okay. So you remember the powder? That's good, Mike. That's what I was going to say. The powder. Like powder. Okay. Good. Uh, I'm getting everybody's name, so it's going to take a few. So it's uh, uh, pop, Yeah. Pop. The powder. Also. You also remember the powder. Yeah. You'll remember the powder. Okay, Sean. That's right. Same. Okay. Here. The credit card information and everything you gave away, like nothing. So you're remembering the, the beginning, giving out the credit card, the money, and all of that. Kenji? Yeah, same. Credit card, money. OK, very good. Thomas? Same for me, giving your credit card night on uh, one but that's it. OK, excellent. Thank you. Yeah, giving out the contents of your credit card, but also hearing the reaction of the audience. They sounded engaged. OK, very good. Thank you, Sean. Uh, uh, Shai on. The letter to the White House. Which one? The letter to the White House. The letter to the White House. Yes. Shows you how old that video is, by the way. <laughs> Obama, <laughs> right? <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, anyway. um, the handing of the uh, information. Okay. So you closing your laptop stage. Right? Okay. So now. Very good. And Candyman. <laughs> Cookie. <laughs> Cookie Man. <laughs> the powder. Okay. Those are all good answers. You'll notice they're all different. Uh, some of the same ones. Um, one thing you'll notice I did not have in that five minute or so presentation, but you, it's something that you usually see in almost every presentation, especially if you went to ISC, you saw them in almost every presentation. What did I not have in that presentation that you always see? So, there's one thing that I want you guys to take away from your two weeks here. It's 
remembering that your PowerPoint slide deck, that's not your presentation. And that, that may be at odds with some of the sessions you saw at ISC. It's possible. <laughs> but for you guys, your PowerPoint slide deck is not why they came in. They didn't come in to watch an hour-long slide deck presentation. You guys are the presentation. You're the presentation. Your slides are a part of it. Do you need a slide deck? I didn't there. In some cases, in some, man, in some, in some presentations, they could be a lot better without slides. Now I use them here, I'm, I'm using them today. In training, you kind of have to have slides. But the key is you don't want to just rely on your slides. You don't want to just sit there and have an hour long slide deck while we're all watching the slides together. That's not engaging. They came to see you, not your slides. Now, why do we why, why do we spend time on this? I get that question a lot. I don't get it as much as I used to, but we know what you guys are going to be doing for us. You're not just going out and making sales. You guys are actually going out as advocates for us. You guys are evangelizing for us. You guys are in front of a lot of our really key players out there. You're in front of customers. You're in front of partners. You're in front of distributors. You're in their offices. You're in their conference rooms. You're at agility. You're at big uh, meetings, presentations. And I would much rather that the people watching you, whether they're at a customer site or at a big event like agility, I would much rather that when they leave, they have that same feeling that I had watching that guy in Beijing going, oh my God, that guy was amazing. I am never going to forget that presenter. I think hired some amazing people there at F5, as opposed to being remembered for the wrong way. God, that was the worst presentation ever. So bored. How long was that? Two hours? Oh, it was only 30 minutes. We don't want you being remembered that way. So we feel it's worth the investment, which I don't think a lot of other companies do, worth the investment to give you guys a lot of time and practice tools to become the most amazing presenters that we can make you. So that when you're in front of people, you're going to be memorable. And that's the key, is I want you to become memorable. And that's why we spend our time with our presentation skills, to create the impact that you can have with your audience. We're going to do this over the course of several days this week and next week. As Brett mentioned, you'll have a lot of opportunities to work on a presentation and enhance it. You're actually not just gonna work on the one presentation, you're actually gonna do other presentations as well. So you have a lot of opportunities, you're gonna be working with each other, you're gonna be presenting in front of each other. Today we're gonna to do some of the basic presenting uh, skills stuff, your uh, uh, verbal and nonverbal communication skills. I'm going to give you a blueprint on how to build a presentation, which is why it's very important that you're not coming in with an existing presentation, because if you are, you're going to throw it away. You're going to start from scratch. Uh, tomorrow, we will cover something that a lot of people wish we covered today, uh, which is, you know, how do I deal with being so dang nervous when I come up there? I, I can't stop shaking and <laughs> I forget my place. So we're going to talk about that tomorrow, though, how to deal with your nervousness. And then on Wednesday, You'll have an opportunity to uh, work with the team on developing an architecture solution on the whiteboard and then delivering that uh, solution to your customer, the fun activity. So Brett will go through that one and give you some really good whiteboarding tips that I think are really valuable. One of my favorite presentation uh, topics that we cover is on Thursday because I hate death by PowerPoint and I'm not gonna lie, just between you and I and the video, I saw a lot of this at ISC. Just tons of it. Because there's a lot of people who are presenting at ISC that are not SEs who have not gone through this. So I've never had the opportunity to get some of the tips that I have about PowerPoints. So they just fill their whole entire hour with 80 slides. Tons of text. I don't want you guys to. So on Thursday, we're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about how to build slide decks that are much more effective, much more engaging with your audience, and then how to deliver them well, how to be a good PowerPoint delivery person. And then next week, 
we will talk about doing demos, how to make sure your demos are good demos, not bad demos, how they sell the product, don't destroy the product, and then you guys will all be getting ASM demos to practice and deliver. And what I love about this activity, one of my favorites, is next Monday, uh, next Monday we're gonna cover ASM all day long. My favorite products. We're gonna go through all the core basics of ASM and how to build a security policy. And then the demos you guys will be getting are all on additional ASM features that you have not yet learned. So in addition to learning a new feature to prepare your demo, and deliver it to another audience of participants, you're also gonna be learning additional features that those folks are delivering to you. So you're gonna learn a lot of additional new ASM features on Wednesday when we deliver our demos. So that's actually a lot of fun as well. So that's what we're gonna be covering in terms of presentation skills over the next several days. We're gonna to start today. So anybody, uh, ever heard of this acronym before and know what it stands for? Keep it, keep it simple, uh, stupid. You're talking to me. <laughs> not you. But, uh, this is what I remember. I'm not sure of the stupid, but... Uh... Well, it depends on who you're talking to, I guess. But yes, it, it's known as keep it simple, stupid. Um, what does that mean? What's the concept here? Is as technical people, which we all are, the tendency that we have to, I'm going to go out and present to a technical audience, so I better be extremely technical, right from the get-go. I better just get right into the weeds and cover an hour's worth of technical content. Now, first off, before I even go any further with that, why do you suppose that is the natural instinct for so many people in the technical field why is that the natural instinct for them to have that approach? Because that's what they know. Because that's what they know. Yeah, and that's usually the main thing. That's, that's what they're comfortable with. That's their wheelhouse. So I will go out and do what I know. A lot of times they feel like that's what the customer wants to know as well. They want to know the technical stuff. Well, yes and no. They want to know it. But does that mean they want to just have an hour's worth of technical content thrown at them in the form of slides with tons and tons and tons of text with all this technical content on it? Not necessarily. Because what's going to happen is if you get too technical, too fast, too deep into the woods, and you start to lose your audience. I look around at ISC. I, most of what I do at ISC is I watch the audience and I see somebody on their phone, somebody else on their phone, somebody on their laptop. What does that tell me? It tells me the presenter is losing their audience. Does that mean their content isn't important? No, their content's important. It's just for some reason, it's not keeping the audience connected because you can't just keep an audience connected with an hour's worth of technical content drilled into their heads. Keeping it simple is a concept where we can do something as simple as using an envelope to make a concept, to make an idea, to use an analogy. Does that mean I'm never going to get technical with my audience? No, that's not my point. I'm not saying I'm not going to get technical. That's the, the fear that I think a lot of people in this community have is, oh, I don't want to come across looking like I don't know my stuff. I've had this discussion with many people before that not only will they not have that impression of you, they're actually going to be so impressed that you were able to get their attention, keep their attention, and you were knowledgeable. You get the triple threat. As opposed to being that person where they left going, God, get me out of here. I can't take any more of this. Um, so keeping it simple, there's a lot of ways to do that. Now I'm going to show you a uh, short video of somebody who's really good at this. He's no longer with us, but he was really good at the art of keeping it simple. I call it simplicity in action. This is that Sony product. Again, one of the best in the field. 
1.2 inches down to 0.8 inches. This is the MacBook Air. Point seven six inches down to an unprecedented 0 0.16 inches. Now, I want to point something out here. The thickest part of the MacBook Air is still thinner than the thinnest part of the TZ series. Okay? We're talking thin here. So, it's so thin, it even fits inside one of these envelopes that we've all seen floating around the office. And so let me go ahead and show it to you now. This is it. Let me take it out here. This is the new MacBook Air, and you can get a feel for how thin it is. Yeah, there it is. There it is. So, uh, for those of you that weren't aware of that, was Steve Jobs, and uh, he was really good at presenting. Everybody knew he was a great presenter. Now imagine the audience, people in that audience, probably a big deal to be able to see and present. They go home that night, they're having dinner with their family, and they're like, oh yeah, we got to watch Steve Jobs present today. He did a, a new big presentation. One of the first things out of their mouth to their family, he had these really cool charts, a couple of graphs that really showed the difference between the MacBook Air and the other competitors. And the thinnest part of the MacBook was still thicker than the th thickest, thinnest part of the that was the first thing out of their mouth. Or maybe the first thing out of their mouth was he, he took the laptop out of one of those manila envelopes that we have in the office, you know, those manila envelopes? And that's how he revealed the laptop. Now, raise your hand if you think that the first thing that this person would share with their family had to do with those graphs, all the measurements and the graphs and everything. Nobody? No. Okay, how about raise your hand if you think they would talk about the, the laptop and the, um, the manila envelope first. That's the idea of simplicity. Were those graphs not compelling? They were great. They were great graphs. They got the point across. The thing is, if he had filled this presentation with nothing but facts and figures and graphs about the CPU and the processor and the speed and the size and so forth, would there have been anything that was memorable all you need sometimes is one or two key memorable moments. And how do you know you're memorable? I'll show you. Um, the idea, though, of props and imagery, I think, is fantastic. We're going to talk about that a lot on Thursday. The use of imagery in your slides. But you don't always need a slide. I love images and slides, by the way. But you don't always need a slide. I use that envelope as well in my presentation. Now. Steve Jobs actually used both. He had a picture in the slide of a manila envelope, and then, of course, he actually had the actual prop. And I just want to uh, remind you of how the audience responded to each of the images that he had. Let's take a look at the slide first. It's so thin, it even fits inside one of these envelopes that we've all seen floating around the office. So we got a response, and that's actually a good thing. Because when you are presenting for 45 minutes or an hour, if you have dead silence for the entire time, that's not a good sign. <laughs> that's not a good sign. That probably means nothing you've done has been memorable or has resonated, had an impact. So at least there was some response, which is great. Let's take a look at you know, the use of the prompt. Take it out here.
Sí. So you got actually got two responses there. The first was the big round of applause, which is great. The second one was that huge gasp kind of a... Now, as a presenter, if that happens to you and you're on stage, you can know without doubt that these people are going to remember that moment. Later that day, tomorrow, next week, they'll be talking about it. And that's a great thing. That's what you want as a presenter. Do you think anybody in that audience doubted his knowledge of his product because he used that simplistic concept of the envelope? I doubt it. I doubt it very highly. Simplicity, keeping it simple, does not mean that you are not knowledgeable. It means that you are speaking in a way that your audience can understand, that we can connect with, it can be fun, and then we're going to get to the content, into topics. So, Steve Jobs said it best. Simplicity is actually the ultimate sophistication. Anybody can go out and just start throwing technical facts and figures, but if you can make me understand your technical concept in a way that any layman could understand it, that's pretty impressive. I always say, explain it like you would to your mother. <laughs> And if she can understand it, then you can get into the technical stuff. So what I'd like you to do, real quickly, is um, I would like you to think to yourself, how am I, right now, sitting here in my chair, how would I rate myself as a presenter in front of an audience? Where do I fit? And I'd like you to rate yourself somewhere between 1 and 10 with one being the absolute worst presenter on this earth, horrible, and 10 being the best, I'm up on that Steve Jobs level, I'm pretty darn amazing. What I'd like you to do, I've got these uh, big, thick uh, whiteboard markers, make sure you use one of these, I've got them all around the tables, and on your name cards, I would like you to write your number right before your first name, whatever your number is, write it before your first name. Now, what I'd like you to do is imagine two weeks from now, next Friday, and you have done everything we've asked of you. You've done all of the presentation skills activities. You have put in the time. You've put in the effort. And you've made the kind of improvements that you would really like to make. And I ask you again next Friday to rate yourself. How would you like to be able to rate yourself next Friday? Friday. Where would you like to see yourself as a presenter when you leave boot camp? And write that number, write that rating at the end of your last name. And then I'm just going to go through and kind of see everyone's goals here. Um, so, Jodong, you've got a 2 to a 10. Now, I can't think you're as low as a 2 to start off, but we'll see. But that's a great goal. Very good goal. I love it. And even worse here, zero, is that a 0 0.1? Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> so like, as bad as you can get. Yeah. So we're all going to, half of us are going to see if that's true here later on today when you do your first presentation. Now, that other number is, what is it, a 9.9? .9? Ah, no, perfection is impossible to reach. <laughs> Correct? Okay. Another, that's about, I would say, in all the boot camps I've done, all around the world, that's the biggest goal I've ever seen. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> shanghai has got a six, two, and eight. That's that's certainly doable. Okay. Mickey's got a four to a seven. Tom, Thomas, six, two, and eight. Tom or Thomas? Thomas. Thomas, okay. Six, two, and eight. Kenji's got a five, two, and eight. These are usually in average what I usually see there. Eric, three to a six. He doesn't seem like a three, but we'll see. We'll see your personality, but we'll see. Sean's four to an eight. Uh, Crayon Pop is a six to a nine. Good, Mike, six to an eight. Okay, See a lot of common similarities here. Job it, seven to an eight. That's your goal. Yeah, I'm probably exaggerated a bit. Um, okay, seven, you mean, you mean so the seven is an exaggeration? Yeah, you think? Yeah. Okay. Five. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Kevin, five to an eight, and Anita is yeah. six to a nine. Great. Great. Now, here's the thing. Um, We've been doing this, Brett and I've been doing this for, for 
gosh, a few years now. And like I said, I've been had the opportunity to do this uh, in a lot of different countries. However, the boot camps I do around different uh, uh, countries, we don't get to go through multiple days like this. So you guys have more opportunities. Um, these goals are all doable. That one's a bit of a lofty goal, but um, they're all doable. We've seen it before. I get goosebumps all the time, always. Um, that's one of the reasons I still do what I do. One of the reasons I continue this job is because I love watching the development of everybody in these classes. It's oh, so inspiring. Um, all it takes from you is the effort. We give you the time. We always give you the time. And it's up to you what you do at that time. If we give you 45 minutes to work on something and you spend the first 30 minutes on your email and then you have 15 minutes left, you're going to probably find yourself having a harder time reaching your goals. But if you put all the time that we give you into it and when I tell you to take a partner and go practice out loud and you follow those advice, that instructions and the advice, you're going to see your improvements and very likely get very close to your goals by the end of next week. We've seen it time and time and time again. So I look forward to that. Um, so we're going to switch now into a second topic for today. I call it the audience, purpose, and message. And you can actually use your books now. Um, the very, very, very first page of the book. I think it's on page one or two. One. This first day is kind of broken into like three, four different topics. This is topic number two. So whenever you're going to go out and present, or if you're going to, if you're a marketing person, and you're going to put up a billboard, or an ad in a magazine, or create a commercial, any of these scenarios, these are three concepts that you should have put thought into. Who's my audience? Who am I, who am I directing this presentation to? Who are they? Who's this billboard? Who am I trying to reach with this billboard or with this ad in the magazine? And then the purpose. What do I want them to do? Not the purpose of the ad. It's not the purpose of the ad. It's what do I want the audience to do as a result of my presentation? When the presentation's done, what do I, what do I want them to do? It's not always buy something. It's not always the end goal. If I look at this billboard, what, do I, what, what should I be compelled to do? You've probably all driven down the street and seen billboards where you're like, I don't know what that is. Maybe that billboard was not planned properly. I'm not sure. And then the messages. These are the messages that are either in your presentation, the messages that you bring up, or the little messages on the billboard, or in the ad, in the magazine, or in the commercial. And every message, really, every message should only have one goal in mind. Every message should be helping get your audience to do what you want them to do. If you have messages that are doing other things, then your audience is going to leave confused. Got too many things. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be doing. So those are the three things. When you're planning a presentation, you should really be thinking about your audience, what you want them to get out of it. Now, on the next page, uh, it goes into a little bit more thought about your audience and uh, what you want them to do. Uh, but before we get to that, I jumped ahead here. We're going to actually do a little activity here. Uh, we're going to look at two commercials, and in each commercial, after the commercial's done, what I'm, I want you to look for is to see if you can identify who you think. I don't know the right answer of either of these, because I wasn't part of the planning of these commercials. But who do you think the intended audience was for each commercial? And what do you think they wanted that audience to do when they were done watching the commercial? And then what are some of the messages you picked up on that would encourage the audience to do whatever you think they wanted the audience to do? 
So I'm going to show you the commercial, and then I'll give you like a minute and a half to write down some of your thoughts and your answers. And then we'll go to the second commercial and do the same thing. So here's commercial number one. Who do you think was the target audience? What did they want that audience to do after watching that? And what were some of the messages you picked up to encourage that audience to do that? And we'll do the same thing. Watch the commercial. I'll give you about a minute and a half. Drop down the same ideas. Here we go. It's commercial number two. Oh, he loves me metal. <laughs> I'm a bit of a motorhead. <laughs> Please. Luckily, I'm insured with Aviva. They're aligned repairs. Give you a courtesy car for up to seven days. While yours is off the road. So I can keep my Motley crew on the road. And when your old car comes back, it'll be cleaned inside and out back. And those little things matter when you're tour manager for Satan's sister. Oh, no! Or the mother-in-law, as she's also a new one. Switch now. Get eight weeks free and a 20% discount for buying online. Aviva. For what matters to you. Okay, same thing. Go ahead and jot down who the audience was, what did they want the audience to do, and what were some of those messages. All right, so let's chat about this together. So start with commercial number one. Uh, what were some of the answers you came up with for the audience? Who is the target audience in your mind? You can just shout them out. MacBook Air. I'm sorry? MacBook Air. So MacBook users. MacBook users, one. Yeah, so would have been the hardcore laptop consumers? But potential laptop consumers. Well, really would have been the hardcore Apple users too, because you were assuming that they would be familiar with the initial presentation. Okay, it's so hardcore Apple users. Go here. Road warriors. Road warriors, people are tra traveling a lot. Okay, those are all good. Interesting, different answers. Now, what the goal was, what the purpose was for that audience is probably a little bit different depending upon who you thought the audience was. So what were some of the different purposes? What should the audience do after watching that commercial in your mind? Buy anything, buy one I'm sorry? Buy anything, buy anything. So you say buy anything, Pad. Yeah, that Apple is bullshit. Say again? Apple is bullshitting uh, during the afternoon. That's not a purpose, though. <laughs> <laughs> that's, not a, that's not something an audience can do. Purpose has to be something an audience can do. So what would, what would, the, audience, what would the purpose be in relation to what you just said? How about changing the perception of what Apple is trying to convey? Yeah, it wasn't even because they, they really didn't even give you an, an option. I mean, the second one gave you an option to actually see or go get it, call this number and get it. The first one do, doesn't. They just suggest maybe you need to look at these things. So it's possible that in some cases we might think that the purpose is to buy a ThinkPad. Some, and some people might see that commercial as more of a change in perception commercial just trying to dispel a myth from this big video that came out at one point. Either one is, again, I was in part of the planning of the commercial, so I don't know the right answer. But it's just a proof that not every commercial is designed that you have to buy something. Um, in fact, I always wonder, like, why does Coca-Cola still put up commercials? We all know Coca-Cola. They're not always trying to sell us something. They just want brand recognition to keep going stuck in our head. That's the purpose, quite often, of their commercials brand recognition, different than making a sale. So what were some of the messages that you picked up on in that commercial? Buying a compact um, laptop or 
computer, which has all the inbuilt features rather than buying peripheral. Okay, so everything can yeah. built in. Okay, yeah. built in. Yeah. The, the MacBook thin uh, feature comes across. Okay. I think they want you to convince that the, the Lenovo offers all features you want, but it even fits in a in battle, so you don't need that uh, Apple with a peripheral. Okay. Yeah. How about over here? Um, no, stuff is, no compromises. Okay. And you, you picked up on that, because probably because that was on the screen, I'm guessing. And what about uh, simple isn't always better? Or the perceived simple, right? Isn't always better. Now, question: Anybody uh, pick up on how many words were spoken in that first commercial? I think it was what? No. Zero words. That's right. No words. How many words were on the screen? Just a few. Yeah. Just a few. Very few. Um, at the end, do you remember one or some of the words at the very end? A no compromise was one, definitely. You remember anything else? X300. Okay, so you actually remember the, 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 the product. That's actually really good. Now, also, another word that came up at one point, when they're pulling the new laptop out of the envelope, there was a word you could see on the bottom right corner of that laptop. Did anybody yeah. catch that? Okay. ThinkPad. That's what we call a subliminal message. If we just caught that and that remember that name, that's a, that's great. So very few words, but a lot of messages. Now let's go to the second commercial, um, which yes, I know a lot of people are like, oh, I can't hard time even understanding this person. So let's see, uh, what were some target audience? What do you think? Family insurance buyers. Family insurance buyers. Okay, that's a good one. Car. I'm sorry. A little louder. My ears are terrible. Not only are my ears terrible, but we got to pick it up on the audio here. So nice and loud. Car, car insurance buyers. Car insurance buyers, okay. You have anything slightly different? Uh, I just said family men. Okay, family men. And the purpose, what, what should that, those audience people do? What should they be doing after they watch the ad? Switch insurance. Switch insurance, okay, that's fair. Messages, what did you pick up on? Why should, I, why should I switch insurance to them? They're able to adjust their product to your needs. Adjust your product to your needs. Yeah, okay. Better service, better savings. Okay. Yeah, other services other Peace of mind. Okay. You guys picked up on it quite a bit, which is actually pretty good. That's actually pretty good. Um, how many words were spoken in that second commercial? A lot. <laughs> too much. A lot. Too much. I, 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 I compare it to those presentations that you see, and you've all seen them, where the presenter's like, gosh, they've only given me a half an hour. And I've got 45 minutes worth of content. I know, I'll just go really fast. That way I can get through all my content. Doesn't work very well. <laughs> um, how many words were on the screen in that second commercial? Not many. You guys catch the, yeah. the screen yeah. text down here? Yes. Yeah, that was about. You guys all read that, right? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> we kept changing too, yeah. over and over again. Here's another interesting question. Anybody know which commercial was longer out of the two? Second? How many of you think the second commercial was longer? Okay, you're wrong. The first commercial was longer. I can say. I just think, so, so I'm going to bookend this by going back to how important it is in both of these that we put some thought into these three concepts, the audience, the purpose, the message, but also kind of connecting it to what we just covered in the last piece was simplicity and how interesting it is in that first commercial without the use of any words whatsoever and very few words on the screen even, how we were able to convey, and before I even say that, I should, I should ask you this, um, of the two commercials, which do you think you would be more likely to remember better a week from now. How many of you would remember the laptop commercial better a week from now? That would be my guess, and you're all raising your hand. Now, it's interesting how we can convey so much, make it so much more impactful with no words, spoken or on the screen. 
second commercial, boy, they wanted to get as much out there. I want to get all these features. I'm going to get one feature, another feature, another feature, another feature, another your message, 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 message. But none of you think you're going to remember that very much. So did we accomplish our goal? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Now, in the next page, uh, as I was getting to, I just wanted to add one more concept to this idea of your audience. So we've got the message. We've got the, the, the purpose. We've got the messages. The audience is sometimes a little bit more tricky. There's a little bit more thought involved with the audience. And I'm going to give you an example, because I love ASM as my favorite product. And so I've been asked to go out and deliver an ASM presentation to this group of uh, folks from a new potential customer. And they're the app security people at the company. Perfect audience. Great. I know how to speak to them. And I'm going to go out and say, hey, everybody, you know, I'm here today to talk about this great product we have with our big IP, and it's going to do all the application security for you, do all the, you know, everything you need to do for all your app security. A little bit I know that these are the guys that have been doing all of the app security in the application for years and years and years. They do all the security coding in the application. And they're thinking, uh, where's my job? What's happening to my job? And so within a few minutes of me talking, they're like, I don't want to use this because I don't know how to use this. This is a new job for me. And my job is potentially at risk. If we're not going to do any more security coding in the application, why does the company even need me? And so within a few minutes, I've lost this audience, even though what I'm here to present on is great stuff. So knowing your target audience is not always just enough. We have to know certain things about our audience. Now, as SEs, when you go out and deliver a presentation to anybody, one of your customers or your partners, how do you typically get information about your audience? Where do you get it from? I'm curious. LinkedIn. I'm sorry? LinkedIn. So you have 100 people in your audience, you go on LinkedIn, every single person? It depends on the meeting, of course. Okay. So, it depends. Generally, the way I get a little bit intros, and then... So wait, you wait till you get there before you find out who your audience is? Well, I, I have an idea, but to get deeper. How do you get the idea? You should know it. Yeah, I, I mean, you know How? Know. How do you know? Well, you, you have to know. I mean, I wouldn't go but to But how? Account. How do you know? You, you're not, again, you're not doing the magic. Account manager, typically. You're, you're, you're account manager. Sure. Okay, that's what I'm trying to get at. Oh. Everybody have your account manager who calls you and says, hey, I want you to do this presentation. Your audience is a bunch of application security folks. Please go out and do this presentation. That's what I'm kind of getting at. It's quite often that's the way it is. Now, tomorrow, when we talk about nervousness, what causes nervousness, quite often, one of the answers that comes up a lot is, I get very nervous because I'm not sure about my audience. I get very nervous that I, they might not be exactly who I think they're going to be, and I'm going to show up with the wrong presentation for that. So I asked them, well, what could I do? Hmm. I'm nervous about this a week before my presentation, five days before the presentation, three days. I can't sleep all night. I keep waking up at four in the morning because I'm so nervous. Gosh, what could I do as an SC to overcome that fear? Because I'm not sure exactly who this audience is. My account manager told me, and you know, of course I want to trust them, but they've done me wrong a few times. So what could I do as an SC? Suggestion? I'm sorry? Very day with your account manager. They've already told me. They're the application security people. And they don't always know either. They, they, yeah, they, they don't always know. know. Title and title. So what else could I do? Anything. Yeah. Am I just left with nothing I can do? Or is there anything I could do? Get a name and a secret. Find anything on LinkedIn. How about if I call the customer and say, hey, I'm going to be coming out there next Wednesday and I'm going to be doing this great presentation. And here's what I know about your audience, what I've heard, but I really want to get validation from you, Mr. Customer, who's put this together, so that I can make sure I'm presenting to the right people. That's my point, is I, don't, I want to encourage you not to always just rely on your account manager to give you all of the information you need, especially if it's making you nervous that you're not sure. Take it in your own hands. As soon as I've called and I've gotten this validation, I'm going to probably be a lot more comfortable. Does that mean that person's not going to give me the wrong information? No, that could still happen. But at least I'd probably cut out a couple of people from the middleman <laughs> lane there. And this person has told me, 
Well, these are our app security folks. They've been doing app security in the applications for five, six years. They're a little bit resistant to change. And I'm like, ah, great. Now I know how to target my presentation. So what I did first is I tried to present to the audience of who I wanted them to be, not who they are today. What I needed to do is present to them from the beginning of who they are today. You know, hey folks, hi there, I understand you guys are app security folks and you've been doing all your app security. What are some of the challenges with that? Yeah, you have zero day attacks. There's so much coding that goes into it. Well, you know what? We have this great product and you're going to learn how easy this product is to use because that's going to be one of the new roles you get to take on here. And everything is done in this one spot. I'm going to show you a demo on how easy it is. And slowly, through my presentation, I'm going to bring them over to where I want them to be, where they're not afraid of the idea of changing to this new way of doing things. So I'm not throwing it at them. So the whole point of the second page there is just talking about not just knowing your audience, because sometimes your audience is who you want them to be, not who they are right now. And you might lose them before you even start. Any questions on that? How to move them to where you want them to be. Well, that's up to you. And that's up to whatever the topic is. But it's it's knowing who they are. So, for example, if, they're, if their cost, if cost is an issue, and you just come in and start saying, oh, we've got all this great stuff, and bing, bang, boom, you might lose them. They're going, oh, that sounds way too expensive. But if they're already a best bundle user, you can say, hey, guess what? First thing, you guys have the best bundle, and I want to talk about ASM, which is going to cost you nothing. Now... I haven't lost them from the beginning. It's just ways to keep them without losing them before you even start. So there's, there's always a different way of doing it, but you just want to think about that approach. All right, let's see. Um, so we're going to do a class challenge here. And um, in this challenge, I'm going to be showing you guys a video of a group of, uh, I think it's six individuals, and they're passing basketballs back and forth. Now, if you've already seen this, just go ahead and play along, but don't shout out you know, answers for everybody else. And what I want you to do is I want you to count the number of times the basketball is passed between the players wearing white. Three of the players are wearing black, and three of the players are wearing white. So I only want you to count the passes between the white clothes players. But I'm going to make it even harder for you. Because they pass the basketball two different ways. They pass it from their chest to their chest like this. And they also pass it by bouncing it on the floor back and forth. I want you to try to keep two different tallies to see who can really keep that attention focused. And it's about 20 seconds. It's not very long. And then we'll see who's got what answer. Your video. All right. So, first, let's get some answers for the going back and forth chest to chest. What are some of the answers you got? You can just shout them out. 13. I'm sorry? 13. 13. 8. 8. 8. 11. I'm sorry? 11. 11. Okay. Interesting. No, none, none that are the same yet. <laughs> 9. 10. 10. Okay. It's none that are the same yet. So, wow. 13. Okay. We have another 13. Okay. So, all over the place. How about on the floor bouncing? What did we get? Two. Two? Two. 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 Three. Two. Okay. Five. <laughs> and third question, how many of you were just distracted by the gorilla? I did not know what it means. How many did not see a gorilla? Really? Okay. Well, I'm going to show you the video again. It's the same video I promised. See if you've been spotted this time. It's really small, so it is kind of hard to spot. Oh, 
So before we discuss what just happened there, I'm going to do another challenge here. In this next challenge, you're going to see three phrases on the screen that may seem familiar to some of you. They're only going to be on the screen for nine seconds. And once they disappear, I'm going to see if anybody can repeat the three phrases word for word. All right? So here they go. Again, nine seconds. All right, raise your hand if you want to give it a try. Once in a lifetime, bird in the hand, Paris in the spring. Not quite. Once in a lifetime, Paris in the spring, the bird in the hand. Not quite. No. Any bales? Nobody? Okay. Let's look at them again. This time, it you want extra help, what I actually recommend doing is reading them all backwards. Sometimes that helps. <laughs> Didn't get them word for word. You spot it now? Uh, yes, okay. This is kind of a cognitive bias thing, though, because I saw some study where, like, you naturally read backwards as well the same thing, where you just, your, your brain is skipping words sort of automatically. So, here's the question, is why? Why did our brain do that? Efficiency, I think. Efficiency? Anyone else? Why, 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 why did so many of you just sort of skip over those words? Efficiency is a good answer. Our brains are kind of wired to weed out unnecessary, to help us out. Those words are kind of unnecessary. Now, the gorilla, why, why, and you, this is probably the biggest, I'm so proud of this, just happy for you guys, this is one of the biggest groups of people that did not spot the gorilla, which is great. Sometimes it's about 40%, sometimes it's even lower than that, but this is a big group that did not spot it. So how come uh, so many people miss the gorilla in the video? Because the gorilla is in black. What did you say? Focusing on what you mean. Because you're focusing, you're so focused, which is great. Try to stay focused. Now, if that video was five minutes long, do you suppose you could have continued to stay focused on that passing of basketballs? No. no. Why not? So here's the thing, is um, over the course of any day, we're just bombarded with millions of bits of information that come at us in so many ways, whether it is on our phones nowadays, that's probably the biggest culprit nowadays, constantly, whether it's a text message or a uh, Teams message, or a work email pop up, or a phone call, or you're on the street and there's sirens, there's buses, there's people. We're in the room here and somebody opens the door in the back. Now, one of the reasons why I ask people to put their laptops down during this training is not because I don't think I can keep people's attention. I like to think that I can, but I also know that a lot of people have their email open. And when you have your email open, then what happens is, is you get that little email notification pop up every time you get an email. And what's going to happen is your eye is going to go down to that, just naturally. And maybe it's from your boss. Maybe it says, hey, this deal's going south. They send it to like four or five people on the team. Now, here's the problem is, most people cannot handle anything more than about seven bits of information at one time. But the average people, most of us, is no more than three to four different bits. We just can't. So what we do is we stay focused. We stay focused or else we're going we're, we're, we're to lose it completely. And we also weed out things so that we 
Our brain just does that. Our brain weeds out unnecessary stuff like extra words. But it takes so little to lose that focus, like that email. So I'm teaching, I've got your bits. But Brett comes in the back door and half of you turn your head to see who it is. Now I've just lost one of the three or four bits that I have from each one of you. I've got to get it back right away. If your laptops were up and that email popped up, I just lost one of your bits. But the email says something's wrong with this deal. Now you're worried about the deal. Now I've lost two of your bits. And now you're trying to figure out how you're going to save the deal. Now I've lost three of your bits. And you're no longer even paying attention to me. It had nothing to do with me as a presenter. It had to do with distraction. And the tough part, the toughest part about being a presenter, no matter how good you are, is keeping your audience engaged. Even the best presenters can still have a hard time keeping their audience engaged because of these darn distractions that we now have in front of us. Everybody's got their phones. And I'm sorry, but no matter how good of a presenter you are, if I'm single and I'm trying to mingle and I get a pop-up from a potential date, that's probably going to take my attention away from you as a good presenter. Well, and unfortunately, you know, we can't take those phones away from people when they come in. When you go out to present, you may not be able to ask your audience to put their laptops down. That just might not be appropriate. So then what can you do? What can you do? Well, here's what you can't do. Here's what you shouldn't do is sit there and read from PowerPoints. Because you just sit there and read from PowerPoints, they're already going to be checking out before you even begin. So you have to keep them as engaged as possible but you're still going to have to give up some of their bits now and then. But try to get them back in again. And one of the things we're going to talk about a lot in the next few days is how to get the audience back, especially if you're losing all of them. So that's the biggest challenge as a presenter. I had an SE once come up to me a few years ago at ISC and he said, I was doing this presentation uh, recently, and I was really disappointed with the audience. I thought they were a little bit insensitive and rude, because a lot of them were on their phones while I was presenting. How rude! And I said, well, I have a question for you. Do you remember when you were presenting and that was happening? Do you remember kind of what you were doing at that time? Were you doing audience participation? Were you doing a demo? Were you doing a whiteboard? Were you reading PowerPoints, quote lists? And he said, well, I know you said not to do a lot of it, but I, I, yeah, I was giving bullet list slides. And I said, well, I got bad news for you. The fact that your audience was on their phone, it's not their fault. It was your fault. It's not an audience's responsibility to stay engaged. It's not our responsibility as an audience. It's the presenter's responsibility to keep the audience engaged. And that's an important concept. You're losing the audience, that's your fault, not their fault. I will finish this by sharing this story. I got the opportunity a few years ago to go to this OWASP convention down in Southern California. Everybody heard of OWASP Top 10? I, as I mentioned, I love application security. I love ASM. I was so excited to go to this presentation, not to mention the fact that it was in Santa Monica on the beach, so that was pretty cool as well. It was three days long combination of main stage presentations and breakout presentations. I was so excited to go learn all this great new stuff. First problem was they wanted to record all the, all the presentations. So that's fine. I'm doing that today. But they didn't want the presenters, they didn't want to move the camera around, so they asked all the presenters to stay behind the podiums and not move. There's problem number one. Problem number two is every presenter just had their slide deck, and that was it. And most of them were just white slide with black text on it, all bullet lists. And a lot of the presenters were not very engaging, kind of monotone. That was main stage and breakout sessions. I tried so hard, because I wanted to learn. I tried so hard to stay engaged. And I, by the middle of day two, I gave up. I couldn't anymore. I couldn't, as much as I wanted to. Much as your audience has the best intentions of, of watching you, if they give up, <laughs> it's 
That's on you, not on them. So keep that in mind, it's really important. So this is where we're about to break, um, but before we break, what I would like you to do is I would like you to think of somebody that you have seen before in your life. This could be somebody you've seen in person, this could be somebody you've seen on TV, anybody, a, a celebrity, a politician, somebody in the, the IT world, I don't care who, any presenter, somebody that you would consider an amazing presenter. Amazing presentation skills. I just want you to think of that person, have somebody in mind. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to be breaking you up into small groups. So I'll do that first, and then I'll explain your, your challenge. So I'm going to put you in groups of three, and we'll see if that comes even. So I'm going to, you three will be one group. I'm going to give you a couple of those, just to make sure you have enough. I'll put you three in one group here. You three together. And we'll do two and two. How's that? So, what I'm going to have you do, we're going to uh, take a break, and then when you come back from break, and you can do this whenever you want, but I'll give you, I'm going to give you six minutes to do this activity, so we'll take a total of 21 minutes, which is 15 minutes for a break, and then six minutes for this activity. But here's what I want you to do as a group together. This is a group activity, not a singular activity, is I want you to get together and start sharing with each other why your presenter is good. Why, what is it about your presenter that you like? You don't have to share who your presenter is. You can if you want, but that's not the part of the activity. What I want you to do is for uh, start listing attributes. What is it about them? What makes them great? And for each attribute, I want you to write it on a post-it note, nice and big like this, not a list of all of your different attributes on one, each attribute on its own post-it note. Now, if somebody else in the group says, oh yeah, my presenter has that same quality, I, I like that, then you can put like a two. That means two people in your group, their presenter has that same attribute, or even a three, if all three of your people have that. And then another one, and another one. By the time the six minutes is done, as a group, you should have at least 10 attributes. You can't think of reasons why your presenter is good, then they're not that good. Why do you think your presenter is amazing? That's what you're going to do during that six minutes. So according to that clock, it is 10 to uh, 11. So we're going to take until right after 10 after 11 to give you the full 15 minute break and six minutes. So try to discuss with your team, do you want to do this now and then go on break or do you want to go on a break and come back? But make sure you give yourselves the full six minutes together. Any questions? And use these, by the way. Big, thick markers, so we can all see them. All right, I'll be here, so if you have questions, you can come ask me. Otherwise, we'll see you in 21 minutes. Well, uh, go ahead and get started with using some of this information. Just, you just yeah. compile together and put it to use. Before we do that, I'm going to talk about three different categories of presentation skills. You've probably heard these categories before. I have my own names for them. The first category that I have is called substance, uh, which you can also think of as the content, the overall content of the presentation. What goes into, what are some of the attributes that you might refer to in terms of the substance? Well, this is the actual meat of the presentation. These are you know, the, uh, the uh, presenter's slides. If they did a whiteboard, it might be the actual whiteboard. Um, the, the, the demo, if they did one. Um, aspects about the uh, 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 presentation, they've got key points that they've made very clear. So to identify those. Also, the message and messages are very clear. And then three things about the presenter themselves, that they're knowledgeable 
organized and prepared. Now you may have some of these on your post-it notes now, and if you do, you might want to pull them out and put them in a stack separate so that uh, they're going to be easy for you to put up on the board in a few moments. If you have any of those listed there, knowledgeable, organized, prepared, key points, so forth. Those are just some of the attributes that define the substance category. So the next category I call style. Now style has nothing to do with how good we look. Sean, I see you've loosened it up a little bit. I was going to tell you, you were a little overdressed for us, <laughs> but you've, you've, you've dressed it down a bit, which is good. But you did have good style, but that's not what I'm talking about. Um, style I uh, put together with our verbal communication. Now when you think of verbal communication, even though you might just think it has everything to do with the voice, it's actually, I like to say, it's everything kind of right around here. <laughs> it's everything around your, your face, what's coming across your face. So yes, your voice has a lot to do with the style or the verbal. So the strong voice, the clear voice, articulate. You can understand them. Good volume. These are all aspects of the style. Good speed, they're not going too fast, they're not going too slow. But other things that we can convey with our face, confidence, you can show confidence. Enthusiasm and passion sometimes are confused one versus the other. Have you ever seen the, uh, the recent, I don't know if he's still the, the CEO of Microsoft, um, Steve Ballmer, his name is? You ever seen a presentation with this guy? You know, he comes out on stage and he's like, hey, everybody! And he's like practically running around the stage like this. You know, <laughs> that's some serious enthusiasm. That's enthusiasm. That's fun when you come out like that. Um, passion, however, is what you truly feel for this subject. I love talking about games. So if I went and had to talk about games for a while, it would come across. The, our, our cloud stuff, I know, is really important. It's, it's not my passion. So if I had to go into a presentation on it, that'd be kind of hard for me to convey passion. Because I think passion is hard to fake. But if I go and talk about ASM, I'm going to show passion because I, I love ASM. I think one of the hardest jobs out there would be a vacuum cleaner salesperson. Because you've got to love this vacuum cleaner. You've got to think it's the most amazing thing in the world. If we don't have passion for what we're talking about, then why would the audience have any passion for it? Got to have some passion for what you're speaking. And then you can also display a good personality and show sincerity. You can do all that with your face. So if you have any of those attributes listed, you could put those in a separate pile for your style pile. We'll call it the style pile. And then the third category is the sparkle. I call the sparkle the above and beyond. These also are known as your nonverbal communication techniques. Long list of the different attributes that go into the sparkle category. Your body language is one category in itself. These are things like gestures, movement, eye contact, which we're going to talk about all in a separate, right after we're done with this, we're going to talk about those three because they're so important. But then look at this other great list here. So many great things here. Using analogies, like the envelope that both Steve Jobs and I used. Because, you know, he and I are like this. <laughs> Anecdotes of things that have happened in the past with you. I think audience participation is really a great way to keep your audience engaged. I always encourage presenters, try to think of something to do, have the audience do. It's not always fun to just sit and listen for an hour. If you can get them active in a way, for even for 10 minutes, that gets them involved, much like you're doing right now. The audience participation can be a great way to keep your audience engaged. Now, it's not just one thing to create slides and do a whiteboard, do a demo. But when they're actually good, when they're good slides, when there's creativity involved, 
Now that's above and beyond. When there's simplicity involved, if any of you have the word simple, simplicity is not content. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. That's above and beyond. That's sparkle. Creativity and simplicity. If they're an entertainer, they're entertaining. If they add some humor, that doesn't mean they're going to come out and tell a joke. That's not what we're looking for. You're not comedians. Humor means you can make things lighthearted, maybe add some funny imagery, or just share some stories that have something humorous in context. That doesn't mean you're looking for a laugh, but if you get one, that's great. A strong opening and closing. Many of you, uh, a couple of you pointed out during my video at the beginning that you remembered me handing out my credit card, my money, my so forth. That was my opening. And that's what you kind of thought you would remember, was that opening. And a strong closing. Any of you that have ever worked with F5 products before, in any capacity, you must have some good real world examples of how this has helped you in the past. Those speak volumes. Relating to your audience. Another thing to go back to the video that I did earlier. Now you may have noticed when, they, when she panned the video to the audience, you may have noticed that wasn't a highly technical audience, those three ladies. They were not technical. And so you'll notice nowhere in my presentation did I ever use the word ASM or AFM or any of that. I tried to make that presentation to them, to what they would understand, relating that to that audience, very important. And then I love the use of storytelling in any manner. Even telling a technical concept in the use of storytelling is so much more engaging than just, let's just talk about technical top topics. So you may have a whole lot of these in your post-it notes. You could put those in a third stack. What I'm gonna have you do now is you'll notice over here on the board, I've got substance on the board, I've got style, and I've got Sparkle. And I'd like you to get up, take all your post-it notes, and place them in whichever category you think they go. Some you should probably already know. Some you might have to take a guess. And then we'll review them all together. Now it's collapsing. Just, you can't, why don't you just pick it up and make sure with your hands. Okay. It's good. There you go. Oh, and I'm going to have you all kind of stay over on this side of the room. Of course, some of you over here, some of you over there. I'm having Brett record this, so I'm just trying to get in the way of Brett. All right, so I'm going to go through these as quickly as I can because there's a lot of them up here, which is great. Um, and some we might have to move around because they may not be in the right spot, which is fine. Um, but clear message we saw definitely under knowledge, uh, under substance, which is great. Being prepared we saw, which is good. Um, staying on the point, key point, these are all great. Simple. Now, I, I, I even specifically use the word simple. When I say simple, when you can keep it simple, ultimate sophistication, that's actually hard to do. That's above and beyond in my opinion. So I'm gonna put that over here. I might have somebody help me out on that one. Clear message, that's good. Focus, they're keeping focus. Yeah, that's good, I'll get there. Clear message, again, got that. Being prepared, lots of repeats. This is good. Knowledgeable, solves the problem. Hmm. I'm going to think about that one. Solves the problem. I'm going to think about that one. I got a lot over here. Wow. Engaging. If they're engaging, it's probably not because of their face. If they're engaging, it's probably because of so many of the things that are over there. I'm guessing. It takes a lot more than just your face to keep somebody engaged. 
That's my guess. So I'm going to put engage over there. I'm going to have, have to use my helper over here. Uh, good pace. All right. That's good. Confidence. Show that with our faith. We talk about that. Warm. Who wrote that? What do you mean by warm? Uh, no, comforting. I don't know. Make, makes you feel. Why? Does it have to do with their face? What does that have to do with? Tone. Their, their voice? Yeah, tone. Their voice makes. Okay, that's, that's good. Clear, concise. That's the message. Concise. Who wrote that? So you talk about the message is concise? Yeah. So that's kind of like the clear message, I think. That doesn't have to do with their face. It's more about the message is concise. I was thinking somewhere nearer to simplicity where the message is. Simplicity. Yeah. All right. I'm going to go there. Uh, wow. Flexible. They can do the splits. Who wrote that one? What do you mean? They're able to adapt <laughs> yeah. to what the audience wants. Yep. Oh, absolutely over there. That's great. That's a good one over there. Uh, energetic. Now that could have to do with, are they energetic just here or is it their whole, is it, you know, their whole body? Like the enthusiasm, definitely, but who are they? Yeah. Energetic. More enthusiasm and like volume is higher than the audience. The energetic voice or energetic overall? Overall. overall? Okay. If it was just their voice, you know, I would probably say here, but if they've got an overall energetic persona, they, they, you know, the whole, they use the whole body to be energetic, then that moves also into body language. It could kind of go in between, but for the sake of this activity, I'm going to put it there. Um, all right. Uh, engaging, we already talked about engaging. We already have that one there. Concise. Concise message, trustworthy. Who are that? We've got so many here. Trustworthy. Who are that? Trustworthy. You ready to write it? Oh, I did. Okay. <laughs> what do you mean by trustworthy? Why are they trustworthy? Oh, is it because they're sincere? Um, they yeah, also have credentials and they're believable, and you know, you don't doubt what they're saying. I don't know. Okay. Confidence. Confidence. Okay. For that, they're genuine. They're authentic. That's sincerity to me. I think that's that's fair up there. Body language, absolutely body language we saw goes over there for sure. Uh, knowledgeable, actually. Over here. Knowledge. Knowledgeable. Yeah, okay. Okay, persuasive's a good one. Why are they persuasive? Who wrote that? I didn't. Why do you mean persuasive? What is it about them persuasive? Um, the way that they present the topic, the product, it makes you feel compelled to consider the purpose of the move okay. forward. Take action. Hmm. I'm trying to think of that because they're knowledgeable. I don't know if it's just their voice. I'm going to think about that one too. Um, their voice, that's good. Somebody actually just used the word style. I don't know if that was a coincidence mm -hmm. or um, ob 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 objection handling. Ah. Ah, so they're able to deal with a resistant audience, a, a, a difficult audience. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Persuade me. Yeah. Um, I'm going to put that over there just because that's actually, that's not really just their face. Yeah. That's that's adapting. Yeah, that's adapting, right which is which is very, very challenging, very difficult. Um, passion we saw over here. Enthusiasm we saw here. Confidence. Wow. Either somebody saw my slides or you were just, you're right on point. That was really good. Adaptable, we talked about that. Being able to adapt is something that I think is above and beyond. Because otherwise, somebody who's not able to adapt just sticks to their presentation, they stick to their slides, and they're like, sorry, no, I can't move. I gotta, I gotta keep going where I'm going, because that's all I know. I think it's above and beyond to be able to adapt. Um, humility, it's like being humble, that we're talking just about. Not, not being arrogant, you lose an audience immediately. If you're kind of yeah. Um, Mm, I've had this one come up before, and yeah, it could come across the face, their, your attitude, your overall attitude, I think, is fair. Confidence, we saw, being authentic. Where did I put authentic? We have that one. Did we have authentic already? Yeah, the yellow on the yeah. on your left. Ah, I did, didn't I? Oh, confidence. Oh, you're thinking about this one? Yeah. 
Oh, there it was. Be genuine, authentic. That's right. Oh, you guys have some really interesting ones. Okay, fearless. I think fearless, I feel like fearless is almost in the same way as adaptable. Um, is it confidence? Who wrote fearless? I did. Give me an example. Why? What, what, what is it about them that makes you fearless? Well, when they're up on stage presenting, they're they're not afraid to talk to people. They're very passionate about the product. They're not hunched over. They have good body language. No, oh, so many things you there. Just, I mean, you believe in everything that person okay. is saying. Oh, well, there's a few different concepts there. You mentioned their voice, but you also mentioned their body language. I'm gonna put it over there just for a second because it's a good it's a good word. I like the word. I feel like it's above and beyond. Uh, focused, what's well, another good one? Focused, staying you laser have focused. Oh, focused, okay, we'll keep over there. That's a good one. All right, confidence. Boy, you guys just got a lot of good repeats here. Their voice overall, <laughs> they're intense. Who's talking about me? <laughs> uh, who wrote that? What makes them intense? Uh, someone with a lot of emotion and fluency. Okay. Uh, here, face, the yeah, scene that. Yeah, but it's a combination of the uh, face, the voice, body language, um, just to provide some. Uh, I'm going to put it in the middle of for now. Okay, because it is kind of, kind of uh, um, in between. Having been there, that sounds like real life examples, sort of. Yeah. Who wrote that? Having been there. Yeah. Lived it. Done it. Giving examples of why I know this because I've been there. That's real life examples to me. I'm not sure where that was, but I'm going to start over there. Uh, your overall appearance, that is not style, as I said, has nothing to do with your face, um, has nothing to do with your, your, your substance either. So just the way that you look overall, I typically put over in the sparkle side. And it's not really above and beyond, but you do want to think about that. And that's an important thing to bring up just for you guys in general. You know, with this company, it's always sometimes it's a challenge, like how do I go out? If I go to do part, uh, partner or distributor training, I usually am dressed like this with an F5 shirt. I think you're probably the same as well. Yep. But you know, if you're going to go into a financial company, you may want to dress a little bit differently as a result. But you never want to be overdressed. So it's always, you know, it's a cat 22. Again, call them ahead of time. Find out. <laughs> you notice somebody adjusted already. I, I, I mentioned that. Yeah, I did. You're overdressed. <laughs> Being able to feel what the customer feels. I've, is I, I definitely being able to feel their pain point. Empathy, I think, I fit over into here. Uh, so we have lots of it. We got engaging, emotional, using analogies, engaging, simplicity, concise, being active, actively presenting. Who wrote that? What do you mean by actively? What does that mean to you? So uh, it's not a presenter where she's super energetic and she's very active. She's making all the audience's eyes to see her the way she's present. Okay. And that Got made it. everyone engaged. Got it. Okay. That's that's great. Just overall being memorable mm -hmm. probably fits into here because you're not going to be memorable if all you do is rely on this. So I'm going to leave that there. That's great. Uh, rememberable, which is about the same thing. They're interesting. They're funny. Uh, I checking. What does that mean? Is that like eye contact? Yeah. Okay, eye contact. eye contact. They're funny. They got that good shock factor. That's that's a great. I love that these breaks. Shock factor. That that's something they're probably going to remember. They're happy. They're in a good mood. That usually means they got a smile. They look happy. They're having a good time. And I hope that's something you guys will find as well. You're having a good time. If you look miserable on stage, the audience is probably not going to have a good time either. Uh, relevant to the audience. I'm assuming that we mean that. What they're talking about is relevant to the audience. They're flexible. They're charismatic. Great words. They got high energy. They're inspiring. Oh, these are also great words. Story, storytelling, correct? Storytelling. Telling is a story, I'm guessing. You mean that? Energy, body language. Talk about that. They're adaptable and they're fearless. Okay. I need somebody's calculator. Somebody hand me their calculator, if you would. Anybody. <laughs> Or you just man the calculator, if you wouldn't. Um, so there have been lots of different surveys done over the years about what it is that audiences do like, what resonates with audiences. 
and they typically fall into these categories. They say, what kind of attributes do you like? And those attributes always fall somewhere into these three categories. And so on average, on average, when audiences are surveyed, what percentage, wait there for a second, what percentage of attributes do you suppose falls under the substance category? On average. How much? 30 to 40? 30 to 40%, you think? It's a little high. 25%? 25 is still a little high. It's actually very close. It's 17% of the different attributes that people list fall into this category. I still haven't figured those two out yet. How about the style, the verbal communication? What, on average, what percentage of attributes do you suppose falls into this category? 30. 30 is very close. It's 33%. So if there's any math whizzes in the room. <laughs> I actually did once have somebody say 60, so. <laughs> math whiz. On average, 50% of what audiences say is in interesting and engaging for them falls into that category. And so I like to find out where you guys fit crowds exercise. with the typical <clears throat> audience. In order to do that, we have to figure out how many total responses you guys all gave together. This is why I use the calculator. So I'm going to add these up. And I think, where would you put this one? I'm just curious. Whichever one actually solves your math. Why don't you just put, why don't you just put one in each since you put them in between? I'm going to go in here. I'm going to go in there. Persuasive. I think they're persuasive. Uh, I'm just going to do that. All right. So I'm going to... At, I'm going to count up first off how many we have here. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So we have 16 total here. In the style, we have 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 18, 21. There's one there. I'll give that, add one for that. So I'll make it 22. Here I've got 2, 3, 4. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-eight, nine, thirty, one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine. What I'd like you to do is add up all three of those numbers for me. And would you take sixteen and divide it by seventy-seven for me? Which one? 21%. 21%. All right. And then you take 22 divided by 77. Oh, 29%? 39%? 29%. 29%. <laughs> and then finally, 39 divided by 77. Which one? 60. No, sorry. Yeah, exactly. Wow. So the reason I love doing this activity is when I first started teaching this class, I just used to tell people, these are the attributes that matter. And then when I did that video I showed you earlier, that's when I learned, uh, kind of, that's when I changed this training around because I was learning how to, a new way to do presentation skills. And the way I, I love doing this activity this way is you guys are actually telling me what attributes are important. These are the things you said are important. These are the things that you find engaging. You told me. And just like pretty much every audience I've ever taught this of, you pretty much fall into the same bucket as everybody else. Does that mean that the contents on only one in five of your answers fell into this category? Does that mean the contents are important to you? Of course not. The content's important to you. However, What's memorable? What's memorable when you think about great presenters? One out of two of your answers were in this above and beyond. What are the things that you're going to remember? And what are the things that your audiences are going to remember about you? On average, are going to fall into here. Which is why as you guys are presenting in the next two weeks, what Brett and I are going to be looking for, are you adding these kinds of things? We know you know the content. 
we want to see you present with these attributes here. Of course, also with a strong voice, you know, with good pacing and all that. Any questions? Interesting? All right, thank you for participating. You guys help take a seat. So we've now talked about all of the attributes that are really great attributes. On the next page, I've got a little, uh, down at the bottom, there's a spot where you think about bad presenters. And uh, I'm not going to, uh, just, just, I'm not going to get any examples here, but let's just talk about bad presenters. When you think about a bad presenter, we call them the top 10 terrible turnoffs, the terrible turnoffs. Uh, I'd like you to just take a minute and list for me the one or two things that come to mind for you when you think of a bad presenter. What are the attributes that you use to describe a bad presenter? And just write those down, and then we'll see what you all say, and then we'll see what the top ten are. All right, looks like you've all got a couple already. So let's start with Kenji. Kenji, what's your number one and or number two? What are your big turnoffs? Yeah, uh, a, lot of, a lot of message is, is in the well, uh, presentation, for example. Okay, I missed that. It's a little bit louder. Uh, message. So no, no, no message. No message. Uh, a lot of message mentioned, but the actual so there are no clear message. No clear message. Okay, very good. Okay, Eric, how about you? Um, I think if it's some kind of. Fake. The, the presenter doesn't stand behind his topic. He has to present it, but he really don't like it. And if you're feeling that, then I really, really don't like it. So you get a vibe that they don't really even care yeah. about this topic. Hmm. Interesting one. That wouldn't be very good. Uh, Sean? What? Product bashing. The what? Product bashing, as in if I'm oh. supporting something and okay. the presenter says it's crap. Oh, interesting. You know, yeah, that'll that be great. <laughs> All right, uh, Chris Pop? Uh, no audience engagement. Good one. That's not good. Mike? Just lack of direction. Sometimes, you know, if you don't, don't have a clear beginning and ending point, it's just set for a million of those. It just kind of goes here, goes on, goes yeah. here. No direction in the presentation. Oh, okay. Uh, Jack? Uh, low pitch, uh, unclear. Voice. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So voice. Voice. Gets you. Kevin. Yeah, I was going to say monotone. Monotone. All right. Anything? Low voice or they have like very fast talking. Very it's too fast. Yeah. And when you say low voice, you mean like mine, like I have a low voice? <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Shidong. Mumbling or Mum Mumbling. Okay. So not clear. Yeah. yeah hard to understand. Okay. Very good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One one? Okay. Shame. I said uh, death by PowerPoint. Okay. I don't disagree with that one, Nikki. Lack of structure. Okay. That sounds similar. You said all over the place. Thomas. Arrogance. Arrogance. And nobody likes arrogant presenter. So we're going to look at the top 10, see if yours fits into there. The first one will be in 10th place. So it's the least offensive of all the uh, offenders. The last one will be the most offensive. So in 10th place is a lack of audience participation, lack of audience engagement. Include your audience. Find some way. Lack of eye contact. That's not good. Repeating themselves. We're probably going to go to about 1230, just FYI. Okay. Repeating themselves, as I just did. <laughs> going over your time. Your time yeah. management is very important, uh, especially if you were at ISC and you were in these sessions that maybe went over their time, and you've got a short time for break, and you want to get your snack, you don't want them taking your break time. Even more important, if you're at a customer site, they might have to get up and walk out, and you haven't finished your presentation yet. You may not be able to go over a lot of, a lot of time. In a few minutes, we're going to talk about some annoying body language. Being unprepared, unorganized, scattered, just uh, using these filler words. One of my least favorite filler words that I might hear some of you say in the next few days is the word basically. <clears throat> basically, F5 helps solve problems. <clears throat> what I've just done is I've just devalued that sentence. 
It's not that exciting that f5 solves problems. That's what basically means. So we're getting rid of the word basically or any of these other filler words. Just base, just be boring or uninteresting. I almost said basically there. Um, being overall an uninteresting person. Reading from your slides, reading from notes. It's okay to have an index card. We all have to have some sort of help, but you don't want to just be reading sentences. And then finally, first place, I heard it a couple of times, is that monotone speech. We have to find a way to get our voice interesting. Ups and downs, highs and lows. Uh, that'll help keep the audience interested. So that's part that's the, the, the part two or part three. Uh, now, we talked about body language. We're going to talk more specifically about body language because body language just in general is a pretty important concept. And I'm going to illustrate why. I'm going to have you all stand up for just a moment to do another audience participation. So I'd like you all to do is I'd like you to put your right arm out in front of you. Okay, very good. We'll warm up. Good. And then put your right index finger out in front of your right arm. Good. Now make a circle with your index finger. And while you're making a circle, bring your index finger to your chin. Okay. Is your index finger on your chin? Your chin. Chin. Not cheek. Chin. Yeah, no. A lot of you have moved it, but I saw a lot of people with your index finger on your cheek, which is really odd. You can have a seat, and you can play that game with your family when you get home. Now, why did so many of you, when I clearly gave you the verbal instruction, actually before I say that, when uh, a speaker's words and their body language don't match up. What does an audience typically give more weight to? The words or the body language? Body language. The body language, exactly. Why, when I gave you such clear instructions to put your finger on your chin, did so many of you end up on your cheek? You weren't listening to what I said, you were following my body language. And so that's why we talk about body language and covering. It's almost more important than the words you have to share. So we're going to talk about the power of body language. At the top of the next page, I have some space for you to fill in uh, some annoying body language. There's going to be a short little video here. And now I have never yet known if this woman is either the worst presenter ever or just an actor. But you're going to see some bad presenting and body language techniques. And so I'd like you to just jot down as many as you can spot during this video. Then we'll go over them together. And here we go. It's not very long. It's about 25, 30 seconds. So I just wanted to talk about our new HR policy because um, it's important for us to review them. And I put them up on slide. skills that you pick up on. Eating the pins. I'm sorry? Eating the pins. Eating nail? Yeah. Chewing the pinky? No eye contact. Now there's actually two different eye contact issues she had. Which damaged itself. One time she was looking down. Now when your presenter comes out, 
And they're like, hello everybody, I'm here today to uh, talk about this. What is that conveying to you? Well, something. Nervousness. The lack of nervousness, lack of confidence. And this is my, my point, is what we're conveying by our body language. When I'm looking down a lot, the average person is getting a lack of confidence or nervousness from that. Whether we actually feel that or not, that's what they're getting. Now how about when I say, now another cool thing about ASM is how it works with uh, some of our other products. When I'm looking up like she did, what is that conveying? No confidence. Indifference. Don't care. Thinking. It's mostly thinking. The other ones I'm not gonna say they're not necessarily right, but when I'm looking up, I'm usually trying to think of something. Okay, what am I trying to say? Where am I going with this? I'm in my head, I'm thinking. And that means I'm not prepared, I may not be as, as polished as I wanted to be. And again, I'm now conveying that message to my audience. Interesting, two different messages from looking down versus looking up. What else do we have on? Arms crossed a couple times. So, when I come out and say, hello everybody, I'm here today to talk to you about this. What is this conveying? Closed. Not open for discussion. I'm really kind of putting a barrier, aren't I? I'm like, I, it's like a barrier between me and you. And that's kind of what the arms closed does, is it's like, don't approach me, I won't approach you. I want a separation between us. I'm not opening myself up to you. So the arms closed is a really strong message, not a positive one, a pretty strong negative message. What else? The hair flips you into the The hair flipping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what else? She was swaying back and forth. There's a lot of swaying. Mm -hmm. Trying to get her exercise for the day. What was the other one I just heard? Oh, the arms on the waist. We're gonna talk about arms and hands here in just a moment. Yeah. She turns around. Turns out. Now, uh, one of the things you're gonna, we're gonna talk a lot about is uh, movement and how you position yourself. But the one thing you really want to avoid is showing, I just say, simple, don't show your butt to your audience. <laughs> um, regardless of what, and now, now, with that being said, why did she look back there? Did she look prepared no. with her presentation? She didn't seem very prepared. She didn't even know her own slides. That certainly wasn't very good either. But so altogether, that didn't look good. <laughs> but definitely not to turn towards behind the audience. That was also bad. Anything else you got on there? No smile. Does she look happy to be there at all? No. Uh, did anybody notice how she referenced a group of people at the end of the presentation? Yeah, young yeah. people. Young people. And how did she reference them at the end? Young people. It was really kind of a snide reference to young people who very possibly could be in the audience. And if I was one of the young people in the audience, I might be like, you know, whatever. So a lot of bad things. So we're just going to walk through it one more time. If you missed any of those, they're actually going to be called out on the screen here. So I just wanted to talk about our new HR policies because um, it's important for us to review them. And I put them up on a slide. And that's a slide? Yeah. Um, so I just Created. But uh, anyway, well, let me just talk about them because I think it's enough for us to just talk about the new policies. Uh, we've got a new few new rules to follow. One of them is that we have to um, make sure that we we include all of our receipts on separate sheets of paper because the uh, the HR has to keep track of all of our separate receipts and different um, files, and uh, it's going to be hard. I mean, I, I think it's going to be hard too, but. I don't know, keeping track of all those receipts is difficult, uh, but that's what we have to try to do. So, uh, in addition to that, most things are going to be online because young people really, young people, this painful sneer. So, a few of the things she did there all fall in the same category. She's doing this, this, this. Why was she doing all that? She didn't know what to do with her hands. She was just like, eh. and how many of you ever had that experience before yourself where you know, you're up on stage and you're kind of like, I don't, I don't know what to do with my hands. Have you ever that, had that issue before? It is challenging. It, it, it's, I, I actually used to do acting on stage too. It's also like, what do I do with my hands? I don't know. Um, so 
A lot of people have issues with what to do with their hands. Uh, even people in movies sometimes have this issue as well. First of all, where did you learn to drive like that? Can you speak up, Ruth? The car, and now we do. And I'm not sure what to do with my hand. Uh, if you could just hold them down by your okay. side. Yeah, great. Well, we were real happy we, um, with what was going on. Uh, at the end of the day, um, <laughs> <laughs> whatever the other name is, let's get more. Everything ended up fine. Okay. Yeah, okay, okay, everything is fine. Thanks, thanks. Great job, Ricky. Good job in the car. Ricky Bobby, a force to be reckoned with possibly in the near future. Ricky. <laughs> so, obviously, a little humor there. But the use of gestures is, me, one of the couple of important things you can do with body language to really help step yourself up as a presenter, get that sparkle, and help keep your audience engaged. Because you can do a lot with your hands. Um, I have everybody stand up again. We're gonna have a later lunch today because I have to get, to a, get you to a certain point before you have lunch so that you have full prep time with your lunch. So <laughs> if you're hungry, I don't eat till four o'clock, so tough. <laughs> if I can wait until four, you can wait till 12.30. Um, but I apologize for that. So, a couple things. In the video, she was gesturing like this. They called it a weak gesture. When you're using gestures, you always want to keep your hands up above your waist. So let's everybody get your hands above your waist. Open hands, no closed hands. You never want your hands to be closed. Always open. And you want big gestures. You don't want your gestures to be like this. Just like when you're on stage in a play, you want to gesture for the back row not the front row. So show me the big IP. That's not very big IP, Kenji. That's a big IP. The big IP. Come on. That's the big IP. Sure. Now show me how at F5 we help our customers from the East Coast to the West Coast. So a couple of things here. One of the things that I uh, recommend is when you're gesturing to avoid crossing your body if unnecessary. For example, we don't need to say East Coast to the West Coast. That's awkward and it's also unnecessary because my arms go in both directions. I can say East Coast and West Coast. I also don't need to use both arms like this. That's also unnecessary. And if I go like this, East Coast, West Coast, they're not, it's not having an impact. So use your arms as you're telling your story, but again, making it big. Um, I also recommend to try to keep your gestures out, not forward. Don't gesture like this, because a lot of times people right in front of you have no idea what you're doing. They see this, they don't see this. So let's do some examples, let's do some practice. I'm going to have some sentences on the board, and I'm going to call on some of you to read the sentences. I'm going to give you a chance to read it in your head, of course, and then I'm going to have some of you read them out loud using gestures to make it a more interesting sentence. All right, so here's your first sentence. So Mike, I'm going to start with you. Why don't you read the sentence and use gestures to make it more captivating. The Big IP system has several models, ranging from the low-end 1600 to the high-end super performance bit Low-end, in front, high-end, I like that. I, mean, have, I have a lot of suggestions for that. Although I have seen somebody before, and they said several models, they went like that, you know. Anybody else want to try this one, just to have their own spin on it? I'm happy to give everybody an opportunity to, I, I usually would have somebody else do it, but you did a great job on it, so. All right, let's go on number two then. How about Cheyenne? With full proxy architecture, a client creates one connection with the big IP, and the big IP creates a separate connection with the backend web server. So I like a lot of what you did. 
This sentence and many others like this when you're talking about our products, it has a, a really, one thing that we can do with gestures is we can play the role of the big IP, which in a sense you, you did. Now a couple of things that I would give as tips is you used a clenched fist once you got there, you went like this. But you did show this side, and then you showed this side. But what you didn't show me is the client connection. You showed me the client, but you didn't show me the connection. How do I show the client connection? It's got to come in. Exactly. And then you left this out there. You've got to show me the connection. So who else would like to show this? Volunteer? Volunteer? Before I pick on somebody? Okay, go ahead, John. With full proxy architecture, a client creates one connection with the big IP, and the big IP creates a separate connection with a back end web server. Very good. Yeah, very good. As simple as that. And just by simply using that gesture, we can take a complicated concept like full proxy architecture and make it a little bit easier for somebody to see visually because of what we just did. As simple as that. Very good. Here's another one. Don, no, how about you? The web page create enormous amount of traffic, but think of caching and compression, response time dramatic have dramatically decreased to respond back to a decrease. Oh, you're good, you're fine. Now, one thing I noticed is you all of your gestures were on this side of you. Everything was over here. Um, show me, uh, again, show me enormous. What is enormous to you? Uh, what's enormous? Okay, that's how you did the first time. You did this. This was enormous to you. So now you just showed me enormous. Um, and, uh, so that was one thing I would say is make enormous. And then use both sides. Use both sides if you can, as opposed to just using one side. Um, anyone else want to give this one a stab? And I really want to see response times decreased as well. So who else wants to try this one? Anita, I'm going to have you try. Yeah. So um, the web page creates enormous amount of traffic, but thanks to our caching and compression, uh, response times drastically decrease. Nice. Do we see that again? Just think of some of that visual. Very good. Thanks. Nice. All right, last one. Another one where we can play the role of the big IP, by the way. Eric, I'll have you go this one. Okay. Um, a monitor will regularly reach out to the web server and then listen for a response. If there is no response, the web server goes offline. Okay. Now, how do you do offline? Like, okay. like close like this. So, first thought, how do you, show me listening for a response. Ah, okay. Um, yeah, some kind of open connection. Like Anybody this. else? Yeah. Show me listening. Yeah. All right, thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm also curious for you all, because this is going to be different for everybody. How do you all represent a server going offline with a gesture? Show me. Offline. Server offline. Everybody. Offline. Everybody has a different way of doing it. Yeah. Right. Okay. They're all different, that's good. You guys can all have a seat. Thank you for participating in that. So we're really gonna be looking for that. And some people say, well, it's not natural for me to do gestures. Well, that's where you have to start trying to incorporate it through the use of practice and repetition. And it becomes more natural the more you do it. A couple of the other items that are on that same page. Um, eye contact. So we talked already about two of the bad forms of eye contact. Let's talk more specifically about good eye contact and why it's so valuable. Um, so let's start by why eye contact is so valuable. So use an analogy. Back either if you're if you're if you're married, let's think back when you were dating. If you're single, let's think when you're dating now. And you go out on different dates, and you're across the table from a prospective date. And all during the dinner, the other person across the table from you is talking about this and their life and so forth and so on. And by the end of the night, we've rarely est established any eye contact. As a result, 
What have we not created between the two of us? No connection. No eye contact, no connection. When we have, and, and as a result, do you suppose there's going to be a second date when there's no connection? I don't know about you, but I don't typically give time for a second date if there's no connection at all. And that's the beauty of eye contact. When you utilize good eye contact skills, you're able to create a connection with your audience. If you don't create a connection with your audience whatsoever, there'd be maybe no second date of that audience. So the rule of thumb is about three seconds with each person. Try to get in their eyes. Some people use techniques if it's uncomfortable for them to look maybe right above their eyes, maybe their forehead, because it's hard to tell. But you want to give each person about three seconds. You want to try to avoid this kind of eye contact. Look, I'm getting everybody. This is great. But there's no connection <laughs> being made there. You also want to avoid, sometimes what happens, happened to all of us, where maybe we get kind of stuck in our head, and for some reason or another, I don't know why, now I'm just like eye contacting with the same person, and now that person's probably getting a little uncomfortable. Yeah. So we want to avoid that really long eye contact. But if you can establish that three-second eye contact with your different attendees, and they get a connection with you, you've got a much better shot at getting that second encounter with them, hopefully. Now, one of the things that I hear from people sometimes is, i got a large audience, you know, 50 people, 100 people. I can't possibly get eye contact with all of these people. So clearly, I can't get a connection. I can't create a connection with my audience. But that's not true. Because we also have another technique in the form of movement. Now, as you probably noticed, I like movement. I like movement for a few reasons. Um, you guys had to watch a lot of e-learnings before you came here. You had to watch a lot of different pre-work. And you've seen a lot of good e-learnings in the past. You've seen some uh, that are not so good, I'm sure. Um, when you're watching an e-learning, and the e-learning has been on the same slide, the same bulletless slide, for five minutes, and it's just audio, talk, 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 over this bulletless slide, <laughs> what is an average audience member of that e-learning, what might they do while they're watching that e-learning during that five minutes? Text message. They might text message. What else? Maybe switch over to their email real quick, do an email. But guess what? As soon as they've done any of those, what have we lost? The e-learning has just lost their bits. Now, they're not even paying attention to the e-learning anymore. So why are we even bothering with the e-learning? So what I do when I develop e-learning, I got this tip a while back, is something on the screen, something on that screen should happen about every 15 seconds. Whether it's a rectangle on something, or a word bubble call out, something should happen. When you're watching an e-learning, and something is happening on the screen every 15 or so seconds, which part of your body is being engaged? Hmm? Your eyes, your eyes, which is then engaging your mind. Your eyes are being kept engaged. And because your eyes are being kept engaged, it's keeping your mind engaged. And then you're more apt to say, oh, I don't want to switch over because I might miss something. If I switch my email, I'm going to miss something important. Keeps your eyes engaged. Movement can have that same benefit. If I'm just going to stand behind the podium, the audience, gets, their mind and their eyes get bored. That's where your eyes get heavy. Uh, and so by moving, it keeps the eyes and the head constantly moving. So that's one of the two benefits of movement. But the other benefit is connection. So I like to use movement, even in a room this size, by coming over. These guys feel left out. I've been talking to you guys. So I'm going to move over here. So I'm going to talk to these guys so I can further enhance my connection with the folks on this side of the room as I finish this thought. 
And then I might back up a little bit, talk something else. But now I feel bad for you guys. So I might move up a little bit closer to you and finish my thought as I connect with the members in the back of the room and move back a little bit more. Notice I'm not turning around to face my back side to the back of the room. Now, when you're using movement for the form of connection like that, there's two rules you want to follow. Actually, whenever you're using movement, two rules you want to follow. I call it the P and P rule. P and P, purpose and plant. Purpose and plant. You should always have a purpose for your movement. If you do not have a purpose for your movement, that's what's going to come across looking like pacing. I'm just going to keep moving because I was told to move during my presentations. So I'll just keep moving. I have no reason to. Then that becomes annoying body language. Now it's distracting. So why am I moving over there? Oh, they felt left out. That's my purpose. I'm moving over there. So what should I be looking at if I'm moving over there? I should be looking at them. I shouldn't be looking at them. So ASM is also a great product. Then it seems like I have no purpose. Why am I moving over here if I'm looking at these folks? My purpose is to connect with them. I'm moving towards them to connect with them. That's my purpose. That's why I'm walking over here. And then I want to plant. I want to plant myself here at least until the end of this sentence and have that pause moment before I move again. That will help keep us from pacing. If I never plant, then I'm going to come across looking like I'm paced. So have a purpose and plan. Even if you're in a large audience, movement can help you create connection. You might have seen this at IFC on the main stage, but if you've ever been to a large arena concert before, you may have seen performers do this as well. Good performers who maybe have an audience right here in front of the stage that are you know, standing the whole time, and they get most of the entertainer's time and energy. They're out there singing to them, and they're going crazy the whole time. Well, I paid a lot of money for my seats right up there, but I'm feeling kind of left out the whole time. But good entertainers quite often will not only move to that side of the stage, I've seen entertainers that have little platforms on either side of the stage, and they'll walk over to the side of the stage they might even get up on the platform and they will start singing for two or three minutes right to this group over here. And I guarantee you when that's happening, this group is up on their feet and they're going crazy because now they're part of the show. They're being included and they all are now feeling a bit of a connection that all it took was for the performer to come over onto that side of the room. So if you're in a large room, you can still utilize movement to create the connection. So that's your movement, that's your eye contact. It also mentions posture on there. Just remember that good, strong posture conveys confidence. Two things convey confidence, by the way. Strong posture, strong voice. Strong posture, strong voice. We come out hunched like that with a low voice. We don't look very confident. Keep your posture strong. Anyone have any thoughts or questions about your body language before we move on to our last topic? We're gonna be watching for a lot of this and helping you help yourselves. And again, if it's not natural for you, that's where you just have to try it. And then next time, try it again. And it will become more natural the more you do it. But just remember, at a minimum, look like you're having a good time. You wanna spend your hour and a half with this presenter, and if the answer is yes, Say it on your own time. <laughs> uh, or would you rather have this woman with a bright smile, big personality, she looks happy. You want to look like you're having a good time. And I hope by the time you leave boot camp, you enjoy being up in front of people. If you don't, it feels like a punishment every time you have to present. This may be a, a tough role for you because it should be a big part of your job. I'd rather go out and cover 20 potential sales at one time that have to do them one at a time. And I love being able to show off myself in front of people, and I hope you feel the same way. All right, the last part, I'm going to try to get through this, but I know it's going to take a couple of minutes. The last part of our lesson, and then we'll go on to lunch, 
And it's important to get to, as I said, before we have lunch, because this is where we're going to talk about how to create a presentation, how to build a presentation. On the next page, I have a framework that was uh, shared with me at this training that I had done a couple, three, two, three years ago. And I think it's a really good framework to avoid what a couple of you mentioned during the presenter turnoffs. You talked about presentations that just have no flow. They just kind of go all over the place. Last year, one of our uh, ISC main stage presenters was somebody from Pixar Studios, which was kind of cool. And he did a presentation and he talked about how they develop uh, animated movies at Pixar. And they always have a story arc. Beginning, a middle, and an end. And during the story arc, they go through a variety of emotions. At this point, the audience should laugh. At this point, the audience should cry. At this point, the audience should be excited, and so forth. But there should be a story arc, a very clear beginning, middle, and end. And your presentation should have the same flow. If you just go in and you start throwing slides into a slide deck, it's not going to have any flow. There's not going to be any story arc. You want to create presentations that have a story arc and also, even better, elicit some of those emotions. You may not make your audience cry. That's okay. <laughs> Until you tell them the price, then they might. But uh, if you can still get some emotions, different range of emotions, wow, you've gone above and beyond. So we're going to talk about these three sections. And I'm going to spend most of my time talking about this first section, which is the opening of your presentation. You may recall in the, uh, uh, the Sparkle attributes, one of the strong attributes was a strong opening and closing. People tend to really remember a good opening. In fact, you may recall, I started off my day talking about a strong opening that I still remember to this day, a year later. And for most of the presentations I've seen in, I, uh, at boot camp, more often than not, I don't remember what they presented, but I remember how they started. So there's three sections to the opening. And you'll notice the opening should be about mm, 10 to 15% of your total presentation time. Take that into account somewhere. It's an hour versus a half hour versus 10 minutes how long that should take. Start with your grab. We call it the grab, then the whip them, and then the short agenda. We're going to start by focusing on the grab. Sorry. Read there, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. All right. 30 seconds. Why did I write that down? What is that relevant to? Anyone have a guess? Introduction. Introducing Say it again. Introduction. Introducing yourself. Agenda. No. That is how long, on average, people take before they have decided if what you're about to share is of any interest to them. Does this sound interesting to me? And then we have seven seconds. Now, you'll probably all agree with this, but uh, this is on average about how long the average person takes to make a judgment about somebody. They look interesting, they look nice, they look well-dressed, they look well-spoken, whatever. How, how quickly do we make an assessment about somebody? So we have a very short amount of time to get things started on a positive manner. When I start my presentation by saying, Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Chris Manley. I'm here from F5 Networks, and I'm uh, here today to talk to you about one of our great products that we have uh, called Application Security Manager, which is going to help you uh, with some of your uh, application security problems and so forth. Now, is that uh, unique? Is that exciting? Out of the box? Is that piquing everyone's interest? No. This is the standard, boring, opening that you're going to see all of our competitors, presenters out there using. This is not a way to grab your audience's attention, especially in the first 30 seconds. So that's not what we want to use as our grab. What we want to use as our grab is a variety of 
different methods. Lots of different ideas. And I'm going to show you some that have been used at some previous boot camps. They all fall, they can fall into many different categories. You can pick. For example, let's see what I got. Uh, one of my favorites, the idea of the personal story, something personal to you. Um, and here is one that was just a few boot camps ago. He used his dad as part of his personal story. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, I want to speak about my inability to repair things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All my, uh, during my youth, I watched my father repair every kind of stuff around the house. He was, uh, from a young age, he was used to taking things um, and trying to understand how they work. So he took them apart and he rebuilt them to understand how they work internally. This is one of the hobby of my father. Most of my neighbors uh, came to him to repair electronic stuff, cars and so on. This was his passion in life. Okay. Do you know what's this? Mm -hmm. Space. Yeah, it's an eye. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's the second more important organ after the brain. It's composed of two million functioning parts, and until now, it's not possible to do an eye transplant because you have to work on tiny vessels, more than one million. So not able to see uh, an eye transplantation for a long time. And just by seeing this picture, you are using half your brain to visualize what's... Yeah. Why I'm talking about eye? Because my father chose this as his job. He's a surgeon and he specializes in glaucoma, one of the, the, the disease that uh, you catch when you get older. Okay, so he had, to sum up, he uses lasers, and do cool stuff with lasers, and at the end, people, blind, almost blind people, can recover sight. Mm. Okay. My name is Jesper Kenny, and I'm here to speak about full proxy. This is the image I chose. You see the full proxy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the most important person, and the person in the middle. <laughs> this is what I'm trying to convince you during this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, in his presentation, what the only real criteria about a grab is it needs to have a connection to your story. Some of my favorite grabs I've ever had is where I'm like, hmm, where is it going with this? I'm intrigued, but where is he going? And there'll always be this aha moment where I'm like, ah, okay, I get it, I get where he's going. But you can't just have a grab where you're like, last week I was on vacation with my family in the south of France and we had a great time. Anyways, today I'm here to talk about uh, the cloud technology. I mean, there it has to be some connection between the two. But I love, and I, I'll give another real-life example, is at ISC, you may recall, uh, one of our main stage presenters, she started her presentation by talking about doing the, uh, the races with her family. Do you remember that? She had the picture of her and her kids doing the race. That was a personal story. And I just got goosebumps thinking about it because that one really stuck with me. Really stuck with me, and I still remember it. I love, and, and not only uh, did I love the fact that she used that grab, but she used a picture of her actual family. Keep that in mind for your PowerPoints, by the way. So I love a personal story because it connects you to your audience right away. It can really connect you. They feel, they know you a little bit more already. Using an anecdote, some sort of an anecdote about anything in life. Here's an example. Football. You call it soccer in the US, right? This is sports. Boards or hearts with passion and hopes. <laughs> One of their examples of passion and hopes was the World Cup that happened a year ago. This World Cup, the golden generation of France took the first spot and Asia have us a big surprise, and South America also made the show. <laughs> but also, passion and hopes makes a profitable business. And a profitable business that reached 3.2 billion people. And these 3. billion people makes, according to the FIFA, 
$6.4 billion, $2 each. Well, looks like a dance of the billions there. Yeah. <laughs> 1.4 were for sponsorship. 1.6 and 2.4 for media. And well, this is a lot of money here. And the question that we ask to us is how they made it? How they made this possible? This is simplify, uh, simply a combination and synchronization between a sales strategy and IT cost. Profit and IT cost. When IT profit grows, profit grows. And this is called digital transformation. <laughs> Sounds familiar to you? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Digital transformation is that brings us the cloud. And I'm Christian Bayona. I'm a system engineer from F5. And I want to talk with you about auto scaling and how we can secure your power, cloud powered business services. So uh, the companies are. They go a little longer because they've only got you guys have four minutes. But you're creating this sort of picture. You're creating this uh, uh, simplistic picture that you're going to then be able to go back to during your presentation. Uh, and his all had to do with the World Cup. Um, a thought-provoking question is another way to get your audience engaged right from the get-go. The question could be a rhetorical question. You're not looking for an answer. It could be a question that you want somebody to answer. It could be a question you want everybody to answer right from the get-go. Um, here's an example. I've got to turn this one down because he's so loud. <laughs> morning. Good morning. morning. How's everyone doing? Morning. Very good. Excellent. <laughs> Have you ever tried to watch an event online and it just didn't work? Never. Yeah. Never. Yeah. Never. <laughs> How do you feel? Exactly. Perhaps something like this? <laughs> well, it doesn't have to be that way for both your customers and your applications. In fact, we deserve better. Hi everyone, I'm David Sawala with F5 Networks. And so, much shorter, got to the point. I think that's great. I don't think your grab needs to go on forever. Got the audience engaged and a little bit of humor. So right within his first 30 seconds, he's got them engaged, and they already kind of like him. They kind of like him, and then he goes on with his introduction, which is great. Um, shocking statement or a fact is a great one. I'm gonna actually skip this just because of the time in terms of showing you the video, but the important aspect about using the shocking statement or fact, got that shock factor up there that you guys mentioned, is this should be something that should elicit a bit of an emotional response. For example, you might say, your network servers are under attack right now from botnets. It's true. It's a true, it's a true statement. Shocking statement. Not a threatening statement. I don't want to make it a threatening statement. I don't want to say, I can get on my laptop right now and start attacking your servers. That would go in a different Avenue. I don't want to threaten that. But it should be something that elicit, elicits an emotional response from them in a shocking manner. A true fact about anything in the world or in the industry. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. So before I begin, I'd just like to ask you a quick question. Have any of you ever received an email from someone? maybe offering you some services from the government you didn't know you needed. Maybe saying they know what drugs you need at the minute. Or as I get a lot at the minute, someone who's been watching what I've been watching on my PC because he's a really experienced hacker. Mm -hmm. Anyone else ever received one of these emails? Similar, yeah. Well, unfortunately, the likelihood is you're all a victim of a data breach. Because most of these addresses come from stolen data from the internet. So I'd like to talk to you about how 22 lines of JavaScript injected 
into a web page for BA would cost them $55 million. $55 million for 22 lines of code. Hi, I'm Matt Farmer, and I'll talk about data breaches. Do you? And then uh, another good example of a current event, I'll give you two examples of how this was really utilized effectively. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had in our, in our uh, Caribbean area, we had massive, massive hurricane. This is one of the worst ones we had. This was about two years ago, two and a half years ago, uh, and it was made huge news around the world. And right after that, maybe a month after that, one of the SEs that came to the boot camp was from Florida. It was right in the path of, of that. And in his grab, he used the hurricane as part of his grab in terms of, I don't remember exactly what his presentation was on. Maybe it was on global availability. I'm not sure. Could have been cloud. Any of those things are possible. But what was important, what was relevant, was that we were hearing about this from a personal perspective. People from all around the world that maybe had heard about it we're now hearing about it from first hand, from somebody who lived through it, with some stunning visuals. And that, again, really created this personal impact. And then a couple months later, there was a really big earthquake in Mexico City. And right after that, at a boot camp, Hector came in, he was from Mexico City, and he did something very similar. Similar, as his grab had to do with the earthquake. And again, his experience, and seeing how people work together, that was what his grab was, how F5 can work together, but how people work together and get pictures, and it was just, you know, it creates impact. A really good grab is one where you're like so caught up in what they're talking about. It's like storytelling it's really gets the audience going. So those are some ideas on how you can think about your grab that you're gonna be putting together. But the other aspects of that uh, opening that I think are important is the with them, which is the what's in it for me. You may recall, I shared this with you earlier today, when I said the reason we're going through all these presentation skills training is because you guys are going to be going out as advocates for us, talking to our customers and our partners. I was explaining to you why you're here and why you're doing this, so that you know. Tell your audience. You're here because you guys are going through network attacks and application attacks, and I want to help you stop having that happen. And then a short agenda. We don't want to spend a lot of time on the agenda, but we want to give them a quick overview of what we're going to cover. That's your opening, all together. And somewhere within there, you can introduce yourself. But don't do it at the very beginning. Then we're going to switch down to the closing, and I switch down here because this is just the exact opposite of the opening. Um, in the closing, we go back to the agenda, but we do it as a form of review. So we say, so today what we talked about was X, Y, Z. As a reminder, we remind them what we covered. And then this was important to you because you told us you were having these attack issues. That's why you brought us in. I'm reminding them why this was important to them. And then we want to have them leave remembering us in a great way. Quite often people remember some of the last things a presenter does. That's what they'll remember. And if you want to close your presentation by saying, okay, well, um, that's all I've got. Talk to me if you have any questions, but that's all. So, uh, it's been great, thanks. That's what they're gonna remember, was your awkward ending. <laughs> so what you wanna do is you wanna have a good, just like your opening grab, and by the way, I do recommend your opening grab is somewhat well rehearsed. You wanna have a good closing grab. And a closing grab could be very similar to your opening grab. In fact, I think a good closing grab has a connection to your opening grab. If your opening grab had to do with the earthquake in Mexico, your closing grab should also have to do with your earthquake in Mexico. Now that you're with F5, even during a national tragedy, we'll still work together. It's something as simple as that. And then you say, thank you very much, and shut up. Because when you say, thank you very much, 
the audience knows it's time to applaud. And you will get your applause. When you say, thank you very much, and then you can email me, and then you can do this, they're like, oh, oh. and then they don't know when to applaud, and, and then you've lost it, and you've lost the applause. So you do a nice closing grab, say thank you, and then wait for the applause, <laughs> take your bow. But I love when the closing grab has that connection to your opening grab. That makes a nice polish. So the last part, and I forgot to do it over prep here, so my apologies, my last part is the meat. The meat is where you're actually going to do your presentation. This is your content. This is the substance. This is your slide, your PowerPoints, uh, your slides, your, your, your whiteboard, your demo, your audience participation, whatever you know is part of your presentation. You'll notice here that um, I've got three topics listed there. I've got three. I'm going to do one last activity before lunch. I'm going to read you a number, and I'm going to see who can repeat this number, but you cannot write it down. All right? Can't write it down, but I'm going to write it down first myself so that I can say it out loud. All right. Let's see who could repeat this again. No writing down. Four, six, seven, nine, two, one, three, zero. Raise your hand if you think you can do that. Go ahead. Four, six, seven, nine, two, one, three, zero. Okay. Anybody else? Want to try? Four, you six, were right, seven, by the way. Nine, two, one, three, zero. What? I lost. Four, six, seven, nine, two, one, three, zero. Okay. Good. I'm going to do one more. All right. Next one. Six three two one five six eight two one three two. Anyway, I'll write it down. Write it down from memory. Okay. I uh, know. Do you remember the first couple? Six, three, two, three, two, three, two. Nine, two, one. <clears throat> there was no nine, two, one. But six, three, two was the beginning of it. So the average, the first number, by the way, was nine, eight numbers. Eight numbers. The second one was uh, ten. No, eleven. Eleven numbers. Um, the average person can listen and hear seven to an eight-digit number and remember it the average person. For most people, when you go above that, it's not like they can remember the first seven and then start drifting off. Once you start going above seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and then they, for the most part, lose all of it. You lose everything at that point, with the exception sometimes that we can remember one part of it. What part was that? The beginning. Sometimes, even though it's really long, we might remember the beginning. Well, guess what? The same thing can happen during a presentation. When I go in and I want to talk about ASM, oh, there's so many things ASM can do. I want to cover everything it can do. So I'm going to talk about feature one, feature two, feature three, four, five, six, eight, nine, ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty, forty. Well, guess what? No audience is going to retain all that. They're going to forget it. At that point, they might remember one part of my presentation, possibly. What part is that? What part is that? If they're overloaded, what part did you remember? The beginning. So at least if I had a strong opening, because I had a really good grab and it was entertaining, at least they're going to remember that. And at least they'll remember me in a somewhat positive way. So let's think of it in a different angle. Instead of trying to cover every single possible feature that is great about our product, let's narrow it down to three key topics about our presentation. Whatever our presentation is, ASM, cloud, whatever, automation, let's break it down into three key things that are relevant to my customer and I want them to remember. Relevant to my customer, I want them to remember. And then each one of those topics, I can have some slides, I can have audience participation, whiteboard, whatever. 
and I'll cover each one of those topics. And those will be my agenda points. Here's my three agenda points. Here's what I'm going to cover. Bum, 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 I covered it. Near the end. Here's the three things I covered. Because now, if I could possibly get my audience to leave, I could cover three things and have my audience leave remembering three things. Or I could cover 20 things and have my audience leave remembering none of them. Which one makes more sense? I'd rather have them leave remembering something, feeling like they got something out of it, and then they'll bring me back and we can cover more. And that's why I like this framework. It lets us build this whole thing from start to finish with a flow. And if you can reference back to your grab, then that actually starts to create a real story arc. That's where it starts to become fun as an audience member to listen to. So that's what you guys are going to be working on in the next uh, hour, and a, hour and a half. We're going to give you time along with your lunch hour lunch 45 minutes, I should say. We're going to give you time to work on this. So here's what you're going to do. You should hopefully all now have one of our topics in mind. You get to pick whatever your topic was. Anything about F5, just anything about F5. And again, I recommend something you're already somewhat familiar with. I don't want you to come up with something that you're totally unfamiliar with that's going to make you more nervous. Come up and feel confident about what you're talking about. You're going to be preparing a three to a four minute presentation. No more than four minutes. We'll be here all day. <laughs> um, and we'll be timing you as well. Um, so try to aim it somewhere between three and four minutes. I know that's difficult. So think of this, I always say, think of this as somebody caught you in the elevator and they said, hey, you came over last week to us. We're in a conference room. Can you come in and just review what you did? you got a couple minutes. Think of it that way. We already have an existing customer, F, uh, Lorax Investments. There is a short, uh, brief bio about them on the next page. So you can read a little bit about Lorax. They're a financial company, obviously, investments. And that's what you're going to be presenting to. So make sure everything you're doing is talking about Lorax. It's got a lot of initiatives that they're going through. If you can speak to those initiatives, great. If your topic doesn't really fit into their initiatives, that's fine as well. Doesn't have to, but it's kind of nice if, if it does. What we're going to be really listening for, I want to hear. We want to hear a grab, some sort of a grab. Be clever, be creative, have fun with this. Try to keep your grab from being technology focused. Try to keep it from being, you know, F five has application security and it's great. So, you know, that's not a fun grab. <laughs> You know, try to have something that's unique, something that's a personal story or an anecdote, you know, anything, shocking statement about the world we live in today, whatever it is. Make sure you tell us why we're here. Give us that agenda. Now, you'll notice I'm giving you a second worksheet, and the second worksheet only has two topics because you only have three and a half, four minutes. You don't have time to go through three subjects, three topics. So you can narrow your presentation down to two key points. And those two key points should be very clearly stated in your preview. We as an audience should have heard what you're about to cover, and then we should hear your two key points. And then a nice closing. Maybe a closing grab would be really cool. So you're going to get a total of an hour and a half. In the hour and a half, uh, Brett's going to walk you over to where you can go and get lunch. Then you can eat lunch there. You're welcome to come back here. Just use your hour and a half however you want to use it. No slides. You're going to be coming up just like this. If you want notes, that's up to you. But I really recommend you don't come up like this to do your presentation. I don't want a whole book. If you need notes, use a post-it note or something like that. But I'm going to try to encourage you to be off book. If you really want to shine, so we're going to be, it's, it's uh, let's see, it's 12.45, so 1.45. So we're going to start at 2.15. I'm going to put that up here. So if you really want to shine, before 2.15, grab somebody, go to a, any space. You can go to a private space. You can go to a little breakout room and just talk through your presentation back and forth 
one speech. Get it out of your mouth. Getting the words out of your mouth once before you're up in front of people is gonna make a world of difference. Trust me, it will. So you might aim for that around two if you're able to. Does anybody have any questions? Everybody feels confident they know what they're up to? What they need to do? So when you said uh, two topics, it's, so uh, we need to practice any of the one topic in the Well, your subject matter is whatever subject you picked. Okay. But within that subject, you're going to pick two key points. That should actually say two key points. Okay. Two key points within your topic. Whatever you think, Lorax, what do you, whatever you think is going to be compelling for Lorax about your subject. What's going to sell us to Lorax about your subject? All right, I don't want to take any more of your time. So, uh, Brett, if you want to take them all, I'll see you guys at 2.15.